So we're going to start. All right. Yeah, everybody settle down. Good morning, yeah, and welcome to the Parks and Recreation Committee on um, hearing on the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2020 preliminary mayor's management report for the Department of Parks and Recreation. My name is Peter Ku, and I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee. Before we begin, <coughs> I'd like to mention a few housekeeping rules. Uh, due to concerns over the coronavirus, I expect we have, a, we have quite a few people uh, watching the live stream. To, me, uh, to them, I say welcome. And if you have any testimony you would like to submit for consideration, I encourage you to submit it via email at hearings at council.myc.gov. In line with the budget process as mandated by the city charter that ultimately will lead to the adoption of the fiscal 2021 budget, today we will hear testimony from the Department of Parks and Recreation on its expense and capital budgets for fiscal 2021. The department's proposed fiscal 2021 expense budget totals $545.3 million, $42 million less than fiscal 2020 adopted budget, representing a little more than half or 1% of the entire proposed city budget of $95.3 billion. The department's proposed capital budget for fiscal 2021 through 2024 totals $2.3 billion, which represents approximately 4.1% of the city's total capital budget for 2021 to 2024. The most recent mayor's management report shows that New York City's park system has improved in almost every way, with better upkeep, greater safety, and new renovations. The past department accomplished this feat thanks to creativity and hard work of its staff, the efforts of thousands of volunteers, and the increasing generosity of private donors. Additionally, in fiscal 2020, the City Council, in partnership with the administration, provided, uh, provided a historic investment of approximately $51 million to DPR's uh, annual operating budget, which is the, last, which is the largest expense in, uh, investment in city parks in nearly three decades. This includes, a, uh, this includes 150 positions which are now baseline, meaning that after six years of uh, fighting to get this position baseline and permanent, these workers don't have to wonder if they still have jobs uh, on July 1st. However, because the department's preliminary budget does not include them, the following funding measures with the city councils put in place last year were not baseline. $9.6 million for additional park maintenance workers, $8.2 million to support Green Thumb Gardens, $4.1 million for additional 50 urban park rangers, $6 million to, for additional 80 pet officers, $4 million to preserve natural forest, $1 million for tree stump removal, $1.7 million for pool and beach season extension, and $5.1 million for parks equity initiative, which is city council funded effort to help build a more equitable park system. In light of this, I 
and many of us in this room are watching today have joined the pay for no, have joined the pay fair for parks coalition the coalition represents over 230 organizations that we are calling on the city to increase the NY city uh, past budget by $200 million for fiscal 21. Again, this represents only half a percent of the total budget. We are hopeful that in the executive budget, the administration will prove last year's commitment was serious and restore these funds. So at this hearing, I will be asking all witnesses, the commissioners, uh, the commissioners included, to tell us what a big difference the additional funding has made. At that, as that investment was a quick first step to properly maintain our parks and forests, we need to make sure it is sustainable. Please use this opportunity today to let the council and administration know how important it is to keep investing in our natural areas and what the city needs to do so that your park and all of our parks have the resources and amenities they need now and in the long term. Lastly, keeping in mind the importance of parks and open spaces, I look forward to us working together by taking the necessary steps to increase assets to parks for all New Yorkers and ensuring that the city's pub, uh, public parks and parks programs are adequately funded in this budget and in all future budgets. I also like to thank my committee staff, especially Monica, Chima, Chris, and Patrick and my own staff as well. We will now hear from Commissioner Silver of the, Parks and pa of the Department of Parks and Recreation. But before we hear from the Commissioner, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are present. We have Council Member uh, Cohen and Council Member Holden. And now the Community Council will swear in the Commissioner and his team. Good morning. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee, and other members of the Council. I am Mitchell Silver, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm joined here today by a number of our senior staff, including First Deputy Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh. Deputy Commissioner for Capital Projects, Therese Braddock, and Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations. As you're aware, New York City Park's primary responsibility is stewarding over 30,000 acres of green and open space, 14% of New York City's land mass, including 10,000 acres of natural areas. We oversee nearly 4,500 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and our forests and natural areas. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the agency's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2021 and to provide an overview of our agency's recent efforts and initiatives in building and maintaining our city's green space and open space for all New Yorkers. We're proud of our achievements over the past year and welcome this chance to update the Council on our continuing work with tremendous support from Mayor Bill de Blasio and in partnership with the City Council, New York City Parks is continuing to find innovative ways to improve our maintenance and operations and expanding programs and services to improve the experience in parks and public spaces. We're working smarter and more efficiently, streamlining the capital process and continuing to demonstrate our commitment to equity in delivering safe, clean, and healthy green and open spaces for all New Yorkers of this great city. Since the issue was present on all our minds, I wanted to note our agency's participation in the citywide effort to manage the emerging public health concerns surrounding COVID-19. 
as the city's understanding of this disease evolves, we're working very closely with the mayor's office and the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As you're aware at this point, the primary message is to all New Yorkers is, if you feel sick, stay home and contact your doctor if you have a cold or flu symptoms, like coughing, shortness of breath, fever, or sore throat. Those who do not feel ill are advised to practice good hygiene and remain vigilant about your health. Along with fellow city agencies, we will continue to work closely with DOHMH to monitor the developments as they arise. Turning to the topic of this hearing, when the mayor presented this year's preliminary budget, he noted it is a relatively cautious and conservative in light of the potential economic impacts faced by the city in relation to the dynamics at the state and federal level. However, it still gives our agency the resources we need to continue getting the job done. The preliminary, the preliminary budget reflects our agency's ongoing priorities, including roughly $28 million for urgently needed capital repairs and our recreation centers, and $33 million for the removal of the decaying wooden groins and replacing beach crossings with more accessible design and materials at Rockaway Beach. The preliminary 10-year capital plan, including the current fiscal year, provides a total parks capital budget of $4.99 billion. And the agency's expense budget includes $545.3 million in mayoral funding for this year for our operational needs. 2019 was a very constructive year for New York City parks in every sense of the word. As we approach the home stretch of this administration's tenure, we're proud to have made significant progress in delivering key initiatives begun under my watch as commissioner. Our three landmark strategic efforts, the Community Parks Initiative, or CPI, Anchor Parks, and Parks Without Borders are all moving into their final phases. CPI, our multi-year effort to reimagine and reinvigorate local community parks that had not seen investment in decades, is over 70% complete, with 47 of the 67 sites completed, with the remaining sites nearing completion. Based on a preliminary study by the CUNY School of Public Health, usership in the initial CPI renovated parks that were studied increased by 50%. Anchor Parks, our $150 million investment in five flagship parks across the five boroughs to make those old parks new again, are mostly in construction. With Astoria Park, the initial wave of long-needed improvements was delivered seven months ahead of schedule. Lastly, the majority of the capital projects created by the Parks of Borders, our initiative to make our parks more open and welcoming, are in construction. In fact, we recently celebrated the completion of the Parks and Borders Project at Seward Park in Manhattan, and I can tell you the park and the role it plays in the local community has been fully transformed. Well beyond these signature initiatives, we've demonstrated our commitment to keeping our parks in the best condition possible, investing hundreds of millions of capital dollars for renovation and reconstruction of playgrounds, ball fields, courts, and natural areas. I'm proud to note that we have completed over 700 capital improvement projects in the first years of first six years of this administration. Our yearly average on-time com completion rate has increased by 18 percent, by 67 to 85 percent when compared to projects from previous administrations. Upon my arrival at the agency, there was a back backlog of nearly 131 pre-existing capital projects that had run into serious delays, stuck in a bureaucratic mire sometime for years. After directing significant energy and attention on these stalled projects, I can proudly report to you that these projects are back on track under this administration. 106 of that 131 have been completed, 23 are now in construction, and two will start construction soon. We have spoken with the council at length, both publicly and privately, about the city's complicated and lengthy capital process and our dedicated effort to reform those aspects of the process that we can control. 
Despite these challenges, Parks is focused on continuing to improve our internal procedures. Even though we're coming to a closure on some of our ambitious undertakings, we are still continuing to innovate and launch some exciting new efforts. As the mayor announced in a State of the City address, we're going to undertake a massive expansion of our recreation and public program opportunities available to the public, especially for the youth of New York City. First, we'll be eliminating the $25 annual membership fee for 18 to 24 year olds, so all young New Yorkers can enjoy free access to our recreational centers around the city, as well as significantly expanding our evening and weekend hours at these recreation centers. Young New Yorkers will have increased access to positive programming and recreational opportunities. New Yorkers can look forward to the creation of nine new recreation centers around the city that currently lack such a facility, and additional existing recreational centers will receive significant capital to create or improve New Yorkers' access to our centers, which offer vital and wellness benefits to the public. In addition to these exciting improvements, I'd also like to talk about the positive impacts for our park system that we were able to make by the generous infusion of funding from the City Council that was delivered in fiscal year 2020 as a result of the Playfair campaign led by New Yorkers for Parks and many other park advocate groups. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm not going to read all of the accolades for, because I'm sensing the mood of the city and want to get directly to your questions. I'll highlight a few. You do have my testimony, and I will go further if you want to know specifically some of the impact of the Playfair campaign, if that is okay. Uh, so I'm just going to name a few. I had it borrow by borrow, but I'll talk about some of the overarching ones for the entire city. With the additional staff gardeners hired with the increased Playfair funding, have had a great impact in our parks and playgrounds throughout the city. For example, in Marconi Park and Jamaica Playground in Queens, we were weed, they were weed infested and had been overgrown with shrubs. But the gardeners hired with the increased funds and provided consistent care and preventative attention even beyond our usual responsiveness to observe conditions or complaints. Our Bronx horticultural team was able to deploy a dedicated crew to our Young Streets Tree Pruning and Mulching project, completing work a full two weeks early, allowing them to focus on maintenance of other areas such as our local green streets. Our New York City Forestry Division recovered dedicated fund, received dedicated funding from the Council for the Forestry Management Framework a multi-year strategic plan created in partnership with the Natural Areas Conservancy in 2018, focusing on natural forest restoration and planting, trail management, and increased stewardship of our city's forests. Utilizing this increased funding, our team has been able to complete our initial benchmarks for the framework, caring, at, caring for nearly 1,000 acres of natural forest and engaging nearly 2,000 additional volunteers and planting over 20,000 native shrubs, trees, herbs, nearly double our projected amount. Our Urban Park Rangers Division was able to add 50 ranger lines, more than doubling staffing levels and expanding our reach to offer programming in undisturbed areas of the city. In the second half of 2019, rangers were able to offer environmental education, recreation, mentoring for programs in all 51 council districts. We were able to quadruple the number of weekend adventure and pop-up programs, which were enjoyed by nearly 26,000 park visitors, a 400% increase in the program attendance compared to the same period of last year. Uh, my testimony will show you how this impact through Playfair uh, has been improved on a borough-by-borough -borough basis, but at this point I will conclude and uh, entertain your questions. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify with, before you today and for your dedication to providing great parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. We look forward to continuing to work alongside the City Council to create a bright green future with a more equitable and innovative park system. We would now be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Silva, for your leadership and your staff. Uh, it's a hardworking job for our city. Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask a few questions and then I let the um, members to ask questions.
questions. So, um, oh, we, we are also uh, uh, present by uh, Council Member uh, Wen Bim. Oh, thanks. Uh, once again, we are beginning the budget process as mandated by the city charter that ultimately will lead to the adoption of fiscal 2021 budget. So Commissioner, can you help us in this process by explaining to the committee the year-to-year -year changes in spending in the department's budget, especially for maintenance and operations and for the capital projects division? Thank you for your question, uh, Council Member. In terms of the main difference between the two, which is not reflected in this budget, uh, those are the Playfair uh, 150 CPW and horticultural work workers. Uh, that is not included in this budget. The stump removal of one million, that was a council one-shot increase. That is not in this budget. The beaches and pools extended from one week uh, was also not included. City Council, uh, other allocations for one-shot discretionary funding for park-related uh, nonprofits, uh, the Playfair for the Park Enforcement Patrol, Playfair for the Rangers, Playfair for the Green Thumb, and Playfair for the Forestry. Those are the significant changes from last budget to this one. In terms of the additions on the expense side, uh, we now have baseline funding for four positions for the Dykeman Marina. Uh, these positions help maintain the marina, which was taken over by parks in the fall of 2019. Uh, in terms of on the capital side, uh, there are some significant recommendations for state of good repair. Uh, this goes to the Tony Dapolito Rec Center, East 54th Street Recreation Center, Hamilton Fish Recreation Center, the Rockaway Beach Resiliency Improvements, which I mentioned in my testimony, sidewalks down by trees, and Playfair Capital Work, which is basically moving some of the green thumb dollars and expense this year into capital so we can help improve sidewalk improvements associated with the green and fencing associated with the green thumb uh, program so uh, what criteria does uh, your department use to determine the effectiveness of its programs of the play fair program oh, yeah, all, the, all the programs you mentioned how you measure the effective we well, primarily we uh, in terms of effectiveness for all of our maintenance work, we have a parks, inf parks inspection program, and we also look at the mayor's management report. Uh, we conduct roughly about 6,000 inspections a year, uh, and that makes a determination about what is the condition of our parks. In addition, we hold monthly operations meeting to digest those inspections to determine exactly how each one of our park districts are performing, uh, where they need support, and so we're able on a monthly basis to determine exactly how our maintenance and operations are performing. And we have those very strong metrics in the mayor's management report. Uh, since the preliminary budget was announced uh, almost two months ago, has the department made any additional budget requests uh, from the office of OMB? Uh, if so, what was the outcome and dollar value of your request? Uh, as you know, throughout every budget process, these conversations are ongoing. Uh, I suspect it will continue to ongo as we work with both OMB, the City Council, as we move through the process as it continues. So there is nothing specific. These are ongoing conversations every year as we enter the budget process, but there's nothing specific I can share other than we're just continuing a dialogue with OMB. Uh, as a result of the Council's negotiation with the administration, the fiscal 2020 adopted budget includes $23.8 million in new funding to support parks maintenance and operations, including um, the allocation includes $4.1 million for additional 50 urban park ranges and $6 million to hire additional 80 Park Enforcement Patrol officers, uh, pet officers. Have all those uh, positions been filled already? Uh, if not, why not? And how many of positions remain to be filled? In terms of the positions, uh, 
The only ones that have not been filled because they're going through the academy uh, is on the Park Enforcement Patrol. Uh, right now, they're in the academy. We always have a level of vacancies within the Park Enforcement Patrol, but in terms of all the money given, we went out there and had several academy classes. Mm -hmm. So there's always that attrition we have in Parks Enforcement Patrol. They happen to be very popular recruits among the corrections and NYPD, and so we're always making sure we're hiring more, but those vacancies are more attributed to attrition than it is to not filling those positions. But on the other positions, all of them had been filled. So could you detail for the committee how the department measure the impact of additional staffing? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, could you detail for the committee how the department measures the impact of the additional oh. staffing? Uh, I can go very detailed because we were able to sit down with uh, the New Yorkers for Parks and Playfair and even the City Council to explain the impacts these changes have had. I did not include that in my testimony, but I can go in more detail uh, and I can go very, very down into the weeds, so to speak. So you can let me know when I'm saying a little bit too much. Yeah. So on a monument care and maintenance, thanks to the MNO resources, permanent art and historical monuments on parkland benefited from increased annual maintenance. This includes the Veterans Memorial Circle, Blazing Star Stark Cemetery, Bronx Victory Memorial, Chelsea Recreation Center Mosaics. In terms of our gardens across the city, we were able to make a major impact at Codman Plaza. Uh, it was replanted three years ago, uh, but had suffered some uh, changes, and so we were able to send in a crew through our gardeners based on the play fair. In the Bronx, the additional play fair uh, on the Bronx Horticulture was able to deploy an entire extra team for the Young Streets Tree Pruning Program, which I mentioned in my testimony. In Queens, the gardeners have made a difference to several Queens playgrounds, including Marconi Park, Jamaica Playground. Uh, both these sites, as I mentioned in my testimony, were weed infested, were able to address it. In Staten Island, we had staff that helped define paths and beds in Willowbrook Park, picnic area, and this was a wonderful training opportunity for some of the new staff. In terms of Green Thumb, we were able to hire nine additional staff to help engage a universe of 550 community gardeners. Uh, and so we were able to uh, make an impact uh, on at least 350 of which are on parks property, managed by groups licensed by the city. In terms of PEP, 64 new seasonal PEP officers have been hired. Uh, and in terms of rangers, 50 new seasonal rangers have been hired. And I did share with you uh, momentarily, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, the impact they've had with some of their program that increased well over 400%. I also mentioned the benefits of our forest management framework, working with the Natural Area Conservancy, stream, st street uh, tree remove, stump removal. Uh, we anticipate we'll be able to remove 10,000 stumps this year uh, due to the Playfair increases. And uh, we also, in years past, uh, with beach and pool, we were able to use that funding to extend our beach and pool season by one week. So those are some of the highlights. We've also captured in terms of the maintenance and operations, what our ratings were in our parks, and we actually did continue to maintain or exceed the mayor's management target. So across the board, we've made very good use of the Playfair employees, and I again highlighted some of the benefits of the impact they've had for this program. Thank you, yeah. Well, so what is the current headcount for urban park rangers and pet offices? Uh, and what will be one second. in the next fiscal year? Is it will be the same? At, but for the one shots, it will not be the same. But again, that will be subject to negotiations during this budget process. But just give me one second for us to get those numbers. PEP is budgeted for 249, and we're going to give you the Rangers number in a second. Rangers are budgeted for 40. Mm. So would it be the same for the fiscal 2021? No, because of the play for one shots, it would go back to the levels I just. Those are baseline. Oh, those are the baseline. Those, remain the same. those would remain the same. So it would be the 40 plus the 249. Okay. Uh, so how long is the training for pet officers? And I believe it's about the, 10. What is the average cost for this training per uh, trainee? We don't know the cost, but it's about a 12-week training program for the academy. I can get you the cost if we can see what that is, but I don't know that offhand, but it's about a 12-week training academy. 
What is the so how long is the training for the pit officer? Uh, six months or? No, it's, it's the 12 weeks. So it's roughly three months. Oh, three months. Right, and we're running several academies because we had so many uh, new recruits coming in. Uh, how, are the, how are the additional 50 urban uh, park rangers and 80 pet officers distributed across the city? Can you give us a breakdown by borough uh, of the headcounts? Yeah. Uh, if I don't have it in my notes per borough, uh, we could certainly get that back to you. I do have the numbers for maintenance workers, but just give us a second to see if we have the numbers by borough. On average, in terms of the Playfair distribution, but for Staten Island, there were roughly either 15 or 16 additional per borough. Okay. So can you walk the committee through the functions of the wildlife unit, a subdivision of the urban park pork ranges uh, within the public pork ranges arm? What is the total headcount of this unit? What they do in the wildlife unit? The wildlife unit? Yeah. Uh, the wildlife unit right now, this was created several years ago. Uh, they're very focused right now. We do have wildlife throughout the city. As part of the urban park ranger program, they do significant education. Uh, we do have our deer management program uh, in Staten Island. Uh, there are sightings of animals throughout the city. The one most popular one this year seemed to be the coyote in the north part of Central Park. So they're out there to educate the public. Uh, we put out posters, materials to really help the public understand that basically our wildlife are the new New Yorkers and we have to, as by having a better environment, we're now seeing an influx of more wildlife. So they do a lot of education. They're the point person uh, working with other agencies, whether it's Department of Health, when we do have animals uh, within our park system and they play a very vital role and they've been very, very effective since it was created. We did play, they did have a role in the past, but now we formalize it with the wildlife unit. I'm guessing there may be about five or six within that division. Okay, I'm sorry, it's 12, so it's grown. 12? Yes. 12, I was about the staff, how many staff there? 12 about 12. Huh. So, um, according to the preliminary mayor's management report, uh, major felonies in the 30 largest parks, excluding Central Park, increased by 21 or 9% when compared to the same four months uh, period last year. So, uh, Commissioner, can you tell the committee why crimes are going up in parks? Based upon your numbers, uh, New York City, in terms of the park system, 1% of all crimes happen in New York City parks. Uh, we continue to work very closely with NYPD uh, to determine exactly where we have to deploy our staff so that we can address uh, some of the quality of life issues and some of the crime that's occurring. Uh, it is a partnership. We have long existed with the NYPD, and uh, this is something I believe you can direct more to NYPD, exactly why those crimes are increasing. But in terms of our role with NYPD, we're working closely with them. Uh, we will deploy uh, some of our patrols uh, to help support NYPD to ensure our parks are safe for the public. Uh, but in terms of specifically the reasons why, uh, we are proud to say that still 1% of all crime in parks uh, occur in parks, and our parks are safe. Uh, but we'll work with NYPD to figure out what is that slight bump and how can we address it. Do you have a breakdown of the number of pet officers assigned to each of the 30 major parks that saw an increase in crimes against property? Right. In terms of, well, generally we have tours that uh, cover an entire district, but there are certain parks like Flushing Meadow, Corona Park. Uh, because we saw some additional activity in that park, we now have assigned uh, PEP for that park specifically. Not all parks, because we have 249 citywide, it's very difficult to assign PEP in all of the parks. And so they do rotate, but there are certain parks where we do have a fixed patrol. Flushing Meadow, Corona Park happens to be one of them and that happens to be the park that we're seeing the most activity happening in our park system. So do you have a, a breakdown of all the numbers? We have the top eight, if you want. Oh.
So we have dedicated pet patrol at least to office at all times, seven days a week. Uh, but in terms of just to dedicate it, sorry. That's in, that's in Flushing Meadows. Oh, so in Flushing, that's in Flushing Meadows. So in Flushing Meadows, there are at least two officers at all times, seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 12 midnight. Reynolds Island Park, we have one sergeant, two officers. Uh, Coney Island, uh, we have a dedicated PEP from May through September. Uh, in Washington Square Park, uh, we have a dedicated pet patrol of one sergeant and four officers. Union Square Park is patrolled by Pet Manhattan South Mobile Patrol. Prospect Park, dedicated one sergeant and six officers. Morningside, uh, we have now one sergeant and six officers. Uh, and that was just a new addition as a result of what occurred at the end of last year. And then Sarah D. Roosevelt, we are patrolled by Manhattan South Mobile Unit. The other parks are covered by mobile patrols, but these are the top eight parks that we now have fixed crews there or mobile units as a result of uh, our trends uh, on, on criminal activity. So uh, what actions has the department taken or plans to take to ensure the city parks remain safe, like in other parks too? How do you ensure that? On a regular basis, we have both our borough commissioners as well as our urban park service work very closely with NYPD on a regular basis. As in the case of Morningside Park, we that had an awful uh, murder. Uh, we sat down with NYPD and our staff and decided to put a substation in Morningside Park. We continue to reach out to NYPD, whether it's cameras, whether it's lighting, whether it's just shrubbery that needs to be cut down. We're evaluating all those parks to determine how do we make them safer. Uh, this is what we call crime prevention through environmental design. Parks Out Borders is part of that approach to make sure we eliminate some of those blind spots and actually illuminate it if that's what's necessary. So we work very closely with NYPD to work on how we can make our parks safer. But it's an ongoing effort both between our borough commissioners as well as our deputy commissioner in the Urban Park Service. So Commissioner, do you believe that additional pet officers can reduce can help to reduce the number of crimes in our parks? And what is the uh, appropriate number of officers uh, that are needed to staff our parks? We always want to make sure that the PEP, our peace officers, their primary role is to enforce quality of life rules. That is why we work very closely with NYPD when it comes to crime. Can PEP be eyes and ears? Yes, they have radios, they contact NYPD when they need assistance, but we have to make sure with 249 citywide, we have to have a strong partnership with NYPD and that is what we're doing. We could always benefit from more PEP officers, but we also know as we go through the budget process, we have to have that conversation as it goes forward, but we have to have that close relationship with NYPD and we do have that relationship to make sure we reduce crime, but always want to remind people that PEP enforce quality of life rules, but they also serve as eyes and ears on their patrol. You always mention NYPD, so do you have a good relationship with NYPD? We have a very good relationship with NYPD, and part of that conversation, working with the youth, uh, the mayor and the state of the city announced this entire strategy. Both the commissioner at NYPD and I agree having more resources for young people will be good, mm -hmm. expanding recreational opportunities, opening more rec centers, is targeting a population that needs to stay busy and active and stay off the streets and learn at the same time. So we do share the same philosophy about reducing crime, having safer parks, having a safer city, but also offering opportunity for our youth. Uh, NYPD has so many prisons in, in all over the uh, five boroughs. Do all the prisons uh, all with cooperative with you? Uh, I'm very proud level? that our borough commissioners yeah. know almost, I know sometimes they change around, but our borough commissioners have an excellent relationship with NYPD the commands, the captains, the chiefs, and that has been long-standing relationship, and it continues going forward. So the answer to the question is yes. Uh, all of our borough commissioners have a great relationship. Uh, I'm sure they even have their own cell phone numbers if they need to make quick contacts. So the answer to that question is yes. Okay. What will be the appropriate staffing level for urban park rangers program? It's hard to say what is the appropriate level. Yeah. Uh, what we're able to do, as we have in the past, because now we have more PEP than we've had in the past, uh, that we uh, focus on hotspots. And we, I'm sorry. 
Oh, Rangers. I'm sorry. I thought they said, well, I'll answer the PEP, then I'll go into the Rangers. Uh, in terms of the PEP, we always go to hotspots, have patrols, that all areas are covered. In terms of Rangers, which can also enforce quality of life rules, is to really provide programming and education to the public. They're adored uh, by the public by virtue of seeing some of these events increasing by 400%, camping overnight, learning how to understand the environment, and so it is very valuable to have our rangers, which is a real educational resource for people understanding uh, the natural environment. So it's a huge benefit to the city. It's hard to say what the staffing level is. We have nature centers, but there are also pop-up experiences where they'll have an event in a park, and now we can increase that programming because we have more rangers and cover more places. They also go to schools to educate uh, our young children, and so we're able to deliver more services by having more rangers. Can you tell the committee how much funding you currently have in the proposed fiscal 2021 budget for pet officers? Well, we don't have it by division. Uh, we, again, give you the numbers of the 249, uh, but that's something we can get back to you. Okay. So of that amount, how much is for contracted pet services to oh. Hudson River Park and Battery Park City, and how many pet officers are assigned to those parts? So there are 81 grant-funded positions and those parks, and this is not part of the 249, this is separate, mm. Brooklyn Bridge Park, the Met, East River Park, Pier 15, Hudson Yard, Hudson River Park, Madison Square Park, the High Line, Reynolds Island, Riverside Park, Washington Square Park, and West Harlem Piers. Okay. Uh, the funding for additional urban park rangers and pet officers a lot baseline and a lot included in the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget by the administration. If this funding are not included at the time of budget adoption, what impact do you anticipate it will have on the parks and on the newly hired staff covered by these allocations? Well, first, uh the budget process is ongoing, so we will certainly determine at that point in time, should it not be funded, how will it impact our agency. In terms of urban park rangers, we will not be able to offer as many of those educational services as we had in the past. But on the PEP side, since we always have a lot of attrition, we'll be able to backfill some of those vacancies. But over time, you will see fewer PEP out there uh, covering, the sh covering New York parks. What we've done in the past, as I said before, is that we look at our hotspots and assign uh, those patrols based on what we're seeing in our park system. Uh, so we will be able to address and make sure the quality of life concerns for the park system remains at the highest level as possible. Um, Commissioner, you mentioned in your testimony uh, you will eliminate $25 annual membership for uh, any uh, teens 18 to 24 years old, uh, so that they can enjoy free access. So how much you charge senior citizens? Just give me one second. I think it's $25. For senior for citizens? For senior citizens. So maybe you should consider waiving those fees too, because seniors, well, they, they always help out the community. They, they volunteer for the parks and do they have the time to help you. So I think you should be fair and uh, treat seniors the same as teenagers, you know? Yes. We will take, take your both sides, yeah. recommendation on the consideration. Yeah, recommendation Thank for you. you. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask uh, more questions uh, in a little bit. I will let some members ask questions first. Okay, so we are also joined by Council Member Vivera, uh, Borelli and Levine. So Councilmember Holden is the first and, and followed by Councilmember Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner, for all your work and your testimony. Um, as someone who has volunteered in parks for 30 years or more, um, 
uh, I can attest to how important our parks are in New York City, and um, I appreciate your leadership. Um, uh, but I have a few questions on on budget, and um, you said you're streamlining the, uh, stream, streamlining the capital projects design process or, and and construction, and um, that's been a sore point for all of us in the council for many years, and continues at least the frustration of not only the costs of the projects, um, and I know the, the hurdles you have, but um, what's the most significant hurdle that you're seeing in the capital projects? I mean, design takes a year, we know that, right, about. Um, is there any way to even streamline that? It's the second part of the question. Procurement, as I've said at uh, multiple hearings, specifically even for the capital process, is a one that is the most challenged that could range anywhere from seven months to two years. Uh, that was a subject of some conversations, a hearing specifically on the capital process. We do have recommendations about how to address it. We're not the only agency that's addressing it. There's no parks capital process, there's a citywide capital process. And so this is a topic where some reforms are made, but certainly it's open to improve them further. Uh, so I'll entertain a question on design, but in terms of construction, we're actually, uh, 27 projects last year were actually done 30 days ahead of schedule. So construction were fine, design, I'll wait for your question, but procurement seems to be the area where the most reform can take place to really streamline the project further. So you said they're listening. Is there any movement, like is there any, um, uh, some, anything promised uh, in, in procurement? Yes, uh, things have improved. Uh, MOX, for example, uh, have streamlined the process through their, of how we work with vendors. Uh, so over the years, yes, there have been improvement. There are some difficult ones ahead. Uh, there's both policies and, and laws and other restrictions. All those are on the table. They're ongoing conversations. But over the years, there have been improvement, but there's always room for more improvement. Yeah, we, we've put a, a lot of money into capital over the uh, decades that I've been involved in parks, but I, I always historically would see uh, not enough in maintenance and, and, and uh, security even, uh, like we, we talked about PEP earlier, but um, what I would like to see is more in, in the uh, maintenance area, I think most people would like that, because um, we make these billion dollar in, in, uh, billions of, of dollars invest, uh, in investing in our parks, and yet, uh, a smaller amount, much smaller amount in maintenance, which uh, I know that's a, you know, it's been an issue over decades, but can you, can you address that, that sure. we actually will put more money? Well, the Council Member, always please, you know, work with the local borough commissioner to identify some of those issues. We have, we have trades in-house that can do repairs. We also have state of good repair, so I control about a $20 million state of good repair budget that could handle contracts between 40 and 700,000 that can get to the maintenance. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about maintenance about the upkeep of material versus the cleaning of a park. If it is the upkeep of the equipment, we have both trades in-house, but we also have state of good repair. So any place where you feel there's a concern that doesn't require full capital improvement, renovation of the entire playground, we do have that state good, good repair money to make those uh, fixes to anything that may be deficient. Have, uh, just a switching gears on, on the um, both tree removal and tree planting. I know there's been some hurdles on tree plantings this, uh, this past year. Uh, we, we're getting um, less and less, it's, it, it appears. Um, have you overcome the, uh, the, some of the hurdles with the, with the vendors? We have our major obstacle were the prices that were coming in. Uh, they were higher than in the past, and so we had to rebid a couple of times until we got a price, even though it's higher, that was more workable. I'm going to defer now to the first deputy commissioner that can go into a lot more detail, but that was a challenge for a while. The prices went up significantly, and we felt as being a steward of the public's money, we had to do a better job to see how we can get those prices down. So that did stall some of those tree planting contracts for a while, but I'll let the commissioner see if he wanted to add anything. 
Uh, council member, yes, we are looking at a number of factors that we think may have driven up uh, the bid prices that we received on a number of our contracts. And yes, it did cause a delay in the FY19 planting program. Uh, we did not want to accept bids that we didn't think were reasonable. Uh, so there are a number of elements that we've identified in the project. One of them has to do with the disposal of fill. Uh, the cost for that item went up significantly. It had nothing to do with the contractors. It was uh, a regulatory, uh, uh, a new regulatory inter interpretation that made it more expensive, and that's a standard item in our contracts. Uh, but we're looking at other things that we think may help uh, reduce some of the increases that we're seeing. Uh, it hasn't played out in, in, in better bids just yet. Uh, you know, there's usually a, you know, a sort of a lag between when we issue new uh, specifications and we see the impacts in our contracts, uh, but we are intently focused on making tree planting as economically yeah, feasible as possible. There's a ripple effect in this. You know, as, as we, uh, if we don't plant enough trees and we lose a lot because of the storms, yes. we're, then we're behind the curve. And so if we could catch up uh, once we figure it out with the prices, but um, um, I'm also, I just want a, a, a question on tree removal, dead tree removal. Um, my own case, I have a dead tree in front of my house for well over a year. I, I put it into 311 and the branches keep falling. It's a small tree actually, I could push it over. Um, and yet the branches keep falling as it gets older and older and rots away. Uh, and it's causing property damage. Uh, I mean, if a car parks next to it, uh, it already hit one car and it had to remove uh, the branches. So I'm getting complaints from constituents about that in particular, that, that we're not keeping up with, not only is, I, I think there's a 10 year gap in pruning, but we're not keeping up with the tree removal. Is there any more in the budget for this coming fiscal year? Uh, we have a, 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 a relatively healthy budget for tree pruning. We are on a seven-year cycle. Uh, we're pruning upwards of 70,000 trees a year just through that program ourselves uh, alone. Uh, we ourselves internally probably prune another 15 to 20,000 trees. Uh, so in pruning, uh, yes, we cannot you know, respond to every request as quickly as everyone would like. We have a pretty solid program. With other tree maintenance, as, as you may be aware, we adopted a risk management approach uh, to uh, in-house tree care, uh, specifically for removals and, and you know, conditions that are uh, potentially hazardous, and we, we've followed that pretty rigorously. We're seeing good results from it. Uh, if uh, you want to give me your address afterwards, we will look in, into it. Well, to I, don't make want, sure I don't want any special favor. No special right? treatment. I don't want to get in trouble for that. No, no, we just Council want to make sure it's been properly uh, inspected and addressed. Okay. Council Member, just wanted to make one point, because you mentioned earlier about the cost, and I don't know if that's one of your next questions, but you're now understanding some of the dilemma that we're in. Uh, when bids, people say prices are getting out of control. When we find a bid that comes in that is way too high, uh, we will not accept it and rebid it. But then we're told, well, you're taking too long to initiate the project. So when a high bid comes in, we have a difficult choice. Either say no, rebid it, or accept that price so the project stays on track. So that in lies the dilemma that either price is too high or you're taking too long. If you rebid it, that can delay a project several months and it's something that we're trying to streamline the process. That is all the procurement process I had mentioned earlier. So I'm just open to have a conversation okay. more about J how Just one final question, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to, I don't want to monopolize this, but um, three, uh, in 311, there's, there's no way for the public, I brought this up at a previous hearing, there's no way for the public to contact PEP on nagging issues. Some civic leaders know how to do it, but by and large, I would like, and I suggested, and, and I think there was some agreement, that there should be a mechanism where 311 operators connect us with a PEP office or office, you know, or area. And could, how much more would that um, be in your budget to make that a reality? That, because I can contact through 311, I can contact DOB, I can contact a, a number of other city agencies they'll put us in contact with. Well, I was, my understanding is when 311 comes in, it goes directly to our central communication. I'm not sure going directly from 311 to PEP. Is, I know there was a hearing, I'm not up to speed about exactly what occurred, but my understanding is when a call comes in, it gets sent directly to our central command, which deploys it out. But sometimes it's, you have to explain things a little bit more. Right. And what I'm saying is they w 311 will not even give us a phone number to, to PEP which is, I think, a flaw in the system, and I'm, we're trying to correct okay. that, because my committee oversees 311 right. technology, 
And I, I would like that addressed. And if, obviously you might need more personnel in, um, you know, in PEP to do this, to answer this, but to actually talk to somebody. We will, I will circle back with staff uh, about your request. I'm not sure all PEP have phone. I do know they have radios, but it's something that will uh, huddle after this meeting okay. and, and based upon your con Yeah, because it, it, it is an issue where, the, like the, the nagging issues, there's no communication. So it's very, very important to improve that. Uh, and yes, I think we'll have to put more in, in the budget, but I think there should be a thousand uh, PEP officers rather than 249 because they are, they are terrific. They don't get paid enough. I'll just throw that out there. Um, they, do a, they do great work. They're peace officers. They should be paid accordingly. And they, they do have a tough job of approaching someone and issuing a summons uh, when they're not doing the right thing in parks. And, that is a, and they're not armed. So um, I think at this point, um, PEP is great. We need to expand it, though. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chair. Councilmember Hulk Uh Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, I think you and I have a number of groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings uh, scheduled uh, for the spring, so I, I'm very excited about that, and I, I think it is to your credit. I believe that, you know, you've done it in terms of capital reform. I think whatever is within the agency's power to try to streamline the process, I think that you've done it. I think that you uh, do deserve credit for that. I think that we both would agree that there are some real citywide issues in terms of the capital process. Uh, to that extent, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about ways that you've used expense and if, the, if there's not an opportunity to expand that. You know, sometimes, like as simple as resurfacing a basketball court, it shouldn't be a $2 million project. If we could somehow, if, if you had the ability in-house to do these kinds of things, I think it could make a big difference. Can you talk a little bit about the yeah, infrastructure? Yeah, uh, maybe we could present a list, but you would be surprised uh, how many in-house projects we're doing. We experimented in Staten Island on a comfort station. A lot of our synthetic turfs we've done with in-house. Uh, we've done our own seal coating and repairing. So we're doing a lot in-house. We have an amazing trays. There's both citywide and then each borough have them. And uh, the work they're doing, so some of our spaces, I had a goal of improving some spaces built in Robert Moses Arrow Step is working. And that was all done by our trades. So uh, it, it is a great idea. And I think we can follow up in the future to share with you the amazing work done with our in-house crews uh, so we do that, but we also have the state of good repair money. On average, it's about 20 million. It's about to go up another 3 million. This is baseline, and all the borrowers are able to use that. But again, it's limited between expense contract from I'm sorry, a, a contract between 40,000 and 700,000. And so uh, right now we're using a lot of those funds to repair a lot of our pavements because that's where most of our parks fail for paving, cracks, deficiencies. And so we're doing a lot of the stuff that not normally council members want to uh, fund, but something we know is critical to the infrastructure and vitality of the park. So we are using it effectively, but it's a great question. And maybe we should follow up at a future meeting to show all the in-house work that we're doing to really maintain our parks that is not part of capital. I would be totally of that, and I would be interested in seeing the information, so that would be great. Um, uh, in terms of, I just want to follow up on, a, on a, a PEP question or two, and I know we had a hearing on this last month, but um, could you just talk a little bit, at, at the, you know, it's great that we're having the, the trainings, but it's the attrition is really the problem. Can you talk about some of the retention problems, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a pay issue there. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, the pay issue is directly an issue uh, well, one, to address the pay, uh, we felt it was prudent to expand the number of hours. And we went from 35 to 40, and so the pay for the PEP offices did increase. Uh, in terms of the attrition, uh, these are highly qualified, highly intelligent individuals uh, that once they're in for a while, uh, many of them end up going to either corrections or NYPD, and so we're seeing that attrition. But wh why would they prefer to leave is the question. I'm going to have to make an assumption. It could be salary. I don't think it's the work experience. Those that are in PEP love the job, love the work, being in a park, interacting with the public, educating the public. Uh, so we highly respect our PEP officers. They do an invaluable job saving lives and keeping people safe. Uh, but we have other options and professions that are always looking for recruits. Uh, again, I cannot say the reason why. I could only assume, but both corrections and NYPD uh, are the two likely places where we're seeing our attrition losses. B 
people have told me offline that there's that there's a, a wage issue there in terms of that that really is. So I think that I think it, it's really in your agency's interest in order to be able to better retain these people, and you're spending the money on the training anyway. Agreed. So I think that there might be a better way. I just also would like you to expand a little bit. Uh, when, you, when you talked about the, the relationship between the NYPD and the agency, yeah, I have a recurring issue uh, that maybe I should do a better job of trying to coordinate myself, but uh, you know, after, um, I didn't even know that PEP stayed on duty till midnight. I thought PEP was done at 10 usually. But I have a lot of late night uh, people you know, who started their celebration in the park at 10 a.m. and decide that they want to go till 10 a.m. the next day. Uh, and I get, you know, uh, there's nothing more, I feel bad for people, I get social media complaints in the middle of the night, like I can't sleep because there's this party going on in the park. And particularly in Van, in the, in Van Cortland Park, because Van Cortland Park, as you know, it falls all in the 50th precinct. However, it is the, the eastern side of Van Cortland Park is very far from the 50th precinct. So could you talk a little bit about the formal structure of the relationship between you and parks, how, how you communicate formally? Well, right now it's primarily based. We have an assistant commissioner over the urban uh, urban park service, and both he, the deputy commissioner, and all the borough commissioners have relationships with both the local precincts and the borough command. So that's just an ongoing relationship where they talk to one another. Uh, just for just for clarification, Flushing Meadow Corona Park, because that tends to be uh, the park that gets the most activity. That is the location we extended it to 12. Most places, as you said, is till 10 p.m. Uh, but we do have this close working relationship. Just most recently in Morningside Park, after the incident, we had to coordinate very closely about how we could make the public feel safe in Morningside Park, and we decided to go ahead and put a substation there uh, because of the concerns the community was having. Uh, but that is something we work routinely with NYPD. We do surveillance to see how can we make the park safer. Is it lighting? Is it cameras? Is it reducing some of the shrubbery? Uh, and they're very helpful. In fact, they have their own SEPTAP team crime prevention through environmental design, and I was very pleased to know that I didn't know. And so there is this close relationship uh, between all our borough commissioners, and um, you could talk to them directly about who their contacts are, but this is a partnership we need to keep our park safe. Well, like I said, I have an issue in, on Van Cortland Park, particularly on the south and the east side. Um, just two more. Uh, my uh, email inbox, I, I don't know much about the issue, but I, 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 am, I am getting a lot of emails about the, the community gardens and the license agreements. Could you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Uh, every few years, we have a new agreement. Uh, this year, uh, there was some concern, and I'll have Commissioner Biedemann respond a little bit further. Uh, to date, we had about 87% of the gardeners uh, sign the new license agreement. There was some concerns uh, about liability. Uh, there was some concerns about reporting of certain programs. This was just based upon some past practice. And so right now, we continue to have conversations. And uh, there was a gentleman here. We, there were conversations. Uh, some gardeners would like those conversations to continue for those that did not sign. But I'll have Commissioner Biedemann give more specifics about what is going on. Yes, hello. Uh, so, as uh, Commissioner Silver said, we have um, about 87% of the licenses in, uh, and there, of those the licenses that remain, we estimate about half of the licenses are from groups that are just having some administrative issues, um, getting together, you know, uh, uh, internal rules about the garden, and half are uh, groups who have an objection to uh, certain items within the license. Uh, but, you know, we are in contact with uh, uh, Councilman Ku's office and uh, Elaine in specific about this issue as well. Okay, I just the 13% are sending a lot of emails. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so yes, just, I'm, I'm sure. Just letting you know. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to ask about the Rockaways because I, I have a soft spot. Uh, you, you talked a little in your testimony about the removal of the wooden jetties. It's my understanding, though, that eminently or sh very shortly, a, a large project yes. with the Army Corps. Could you talk about how the two projects are related? And they are related. It was not part of the Army Corps project, but I'll let Commissioner Kavanaugh go into a lot more detail about why we're spending that money to do that part of the project. Uh, we asked the Army Corps to, uh, if they could possibly remove the wooden jetties while they were installing the new groins and redesigning the existing groins. They agreed to include that in their solicitation. 
uh, it's called a betterment in the Army Corps contracting language. Uh, the city, and the commissioner mentioned this in his testimony, uh, provided, uh, uh, I think it's about $8 million in the next capital budget to cover those costs. We don't know what the cost will be yet. The project hasn't been bid, uh, and we don't know if it'll cover all of the, uh, the wooden jetties just yet. Uh, but the Army Corps, as they always are, has been very cooperative and uh, is working with us to uh, make that happen. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the timeline for that project and, it, it, uh, you know, uh, there's been a, maybe a lack of communication or just maybe not, I'm not as on top of it. Are they going to do the groin replacement from Beach 9th Street all the way to 149th Street or? It's, it doesn't go all the way to Beach 9th Street. It starts, I think, at Beach 36th and goes up to 149th, in fact. It does, it does. Um, there are 18 groins that are going to be either newly created, I think it is, 11 new groins and uh, seven that will be redesigned uh, to uh, better prevent erosion. Uh, the core's schedule, they are out to bid right now. Um, they may be able to open bids at the end of this month. Uh, there were some administrative things that still needed to happen for that. Uh, it's on an extremely accelerated timeline uh, that they were able to do this and we're grateful for that. Uh, it's unclear as to when work will actually start. A lot depends on the contractor, their ability to mobilize staff, you know, this type of contract work is in demand all over the country, uh, and, you know, the, uh, the procurement of the materials that are needed to actually build the groins. So it's moving very quickly. They should have more information uh, within the next month, uh, but there are still some unknowns out there. Uh, and just lastly on this point, uh they're also going to do the dune, dune replacement as part of this project? Not in the initial phase. The first phase is only going to be for the groin and the, the wooden jetty uh, r removal. Uh, subsequent phases will install the structured dunes and the crossovers and a beach replenishment, a full replenishment of the beach. So we're, we're talking about several, five years, six years, seven, a long-term project. I think that's a safe assumption. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. And, uh, I was told by the administration, uh, the central staff, that we have time until one o'clock. So we had to be like, uh, make our questions short and concise. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are joined by Councilmember Adams, and then uh, the next one who asks a question is Councilmember Rivera. And please, uh, can you ask in uh, three minutes, or four minutes time, less than four minutes. Okay? How much time do I have? I blame Bob. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, okay. Um, well, I'm just gonna ask my questions, Peter. We're, we'll get through this. I wanna ask a couple follow-up questions about the community gardens, specifically on the licensing agreements. You mentioned that uh, many of the gardeners have signed the licensing agreements. Um, however, some of them clearly have not. Are you going to meet with them? So we have uh, met many times with uh, the um, NYCCGC and Lungs and we're very happy and ha actually have set up some meetings moving forward with uh, certain garden groups, individual garden groups who have not yet signed the license. So yes, we'll talk to any garden. So you're, you're committed to following up with the gardeners to, to discuss their concerns. Even though you may have met with them before, you will follow up with them, correct? Uh, yes, we will follow up with individual gardens, yes. So personal liability is a huge concern for the gardeners. They're all volunteers, as you know, and give countless hours. And so the feedback that I've gotten from the gardeners in my community is that the guidance on the liability to individuals who sign the licenses has been a bit murky. Yeah. And well, can we get clarity on who holds liability for in incidents in the gardens? I know that insurance would cost $250,000. Can parks cover the cost of this insurance to the gardeners? So it's our guy, um, so if I could split out, I think there were two issues there, Absolutely. right? So it's um, the issue of liability, who signs the license. Um, the definition of um, who, uh, the party who signs the license, the licensee, right, is um, written into the license. And it is our guidance, our legal guidance, that uh, we can't provide um, a detailed explanation as to, you know, a hypothetical explanation as to 
who would be liable for what in a hypothetical situation. That's something for the gardeners to ask, uh, that they should ask an outside legal counsel. Um, now, regarding the issue of insurance, uh, it is, you know, our guidance from our lawyers and from city law that uh, it is not structurally possible or legally possible for the city to purchase uh, insurance for uh, licensed groups. We don't do this for groups who license with the Parks Department. But you're imposing additional requirements for events in the garden without demonstrating that actually that the gardeners can handle what is going to be an additional volume of paperwork. So are you planning to at least provide additional staff to ensure that the gardeners can hold their events without worrying about having the necessary permits? What kind of additional administrative support are you going to provide considering that this is another burden for a group of volunteers? So if it's possible, I'd like to clarify the point about uh, events and uh, permitting events. So. Th that is true, that in the new license there is a requirement that gardens give uh, the Green Thumb staff a prior notification uh, that they're, if they're to hold a public event in the garden. Now we did this because uh, in the past there were some events where unfortunately people were hurt, so we wanted a heads up about what these events were going to be. Uh, we have taken every effort to make the approval for events as quick as possible and as uh, light a burden on the gardeners as possible. So there's a Google form that they can fill out. Uh, it's one page, there's some radio buttons and a quick uh, field for a description of what the event is. Uh, thanks to the, Grow to, uh, the um, uh, Playfair funding, we have been able to add some staff members and some outreach coordinators which have allowed us to uh, turn around that, those approvals very quickly. So we're, we understand and we're thankful that you eliminated that indemnity clause, but I just, you know, the gardeners in my neighborhood, they're worried about assuming personal liability for these events because they've signed the license. So I know we have work to do. I don't have a lot of time. So I, I just ask, many of my constituents are here. I ask that we really try to work on something. You know, the history of, of the gardens and what they do and why they're there is really important and needs to be honored and respected. The last thing I'll just ask, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm just going to ask for them to give me an update on Albano Park and the MTA being responsive to parks and transferring this playground so construction can begin. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for being so gracious with time. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, the Law Department is working on this one. We don't have any update information. Uh, this is a concern of us as well, but there's just no new update we can share with you. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. Please, it's been ongoing, dating back to my predecessor, and I appreciate you trying. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, Commissioner, follow up on the community garden, all right? So, uh, in your memory, how many incidents uh, of lawsuits against the city uh, involving community gardens in the past? Do they do they always have accidents there, or, or they have none? So. We, d we don't have that number. We can get that for you. I mean, do they, does it happen? Did it happen before? Incidents do occur, uh -huh. yes, but in terms of how many since I have been here in my six years or something, we'll have to get back to you. And, and well, do you have any high amounts of payout or like, million dollars? So we just like, what are the minor payouts? No. In terms of incidences and lawsuits, is something yeah. we'll have to get back to you? It's okay. Council Member Levine, can you limit your question to five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Council, maybe five minutes there. Sergeant Lamont. Um, good morning, uh, Commissioner, and, and to everybody here. Um, so I'm I'm wearing the Playfair sticker, and I'm I'm a brother in arms with all of you here who are in this fight for great green space and especially our community gardens we're in a really tough fight now um, but we're in the midst of a pandemic and I can't ask anything not about that right now
What portion of your staff is doing administrative or office work as opposed to out in the field? Approximately 20%. 1,200 about? Um, trying to think quickly. Okay. No, it's about 800, I would say. What's the plan for telecommuting for them today? Those conversations are ongoing. We identified the titles, the staff, and now we're looking at the infrastructure to support them. Uh, but actually, as soon as I leave this hearing, we're going to start to have that discussion, see how it could be deployed. When will that plan be announced? We're working together with the, the mayor's office and all the agencies exploring telework. I uh, believe, like I said, today is when we're going to go back. We've done all the work in terms of identifying the employees. Uh, now it's the infrastructure, which means just access, laptops, et cetera, so that we can go ahead and, and implement it. But we do have the list. Are you still doing large-scale meetings internally? Uh, we have now, with the announcement yesterday, we're contacting anyone who has an event more than 500 to have those events canceled. Uh, and in terms of even our internal meetings, our meetings, we're now moving toward either go-to meetings or conference calls with a lot of commissions you see here to prevent travel. And so we're looking even further about our other events. That also conversation will happen today. But we're relying on also the guidance from the Department of uh, Mental Health and Hygiene. What's the maximum size for a permitted internal meeting? In terms of internal meeting, I don't think there's a permitted size at this point. Uh, it's limited by our space, but we're now tamping down on any new events and permitted events until we get more guidance from DOHMH. Uh, in terms of our office itself, uh, we're spacing ourselves in conference rooms as we sit, uh, but those are other conversations that are happening today. Our initial guidance uh, from the mayor's office, emergency management, and the mayor's uh, for the Department of Health was to implement all the guidance they gave us to our staff and to the general public in terms of cleaning, in terms of developing a telework policy and staggering staff. All those are right now uh, in movement, and we're going to talk further about internal meetings and gatherings within parks. This needs to be resolved today. You've got to have a commuting policy. You've got to, have, you've got to be staggering commutes. You've got to push teleconferencing. You've got to have limits on meetings of your staff. Anybody who cares about the park system needs your team to function. And if on top of every other blow the city is endur enduring, the park system breaks down, uh, the mental health Im impacts, the public policy imp impacts, the, the, the impacts on our body and our spirits are going to be unacceptable. Council member, I take this very, very seriously. Uh, we were in close contact with the mayor's office. Our team has been having daily calls. Uh, with the administration and internally there are daily meetings we have gotten all the information to go ahead and pull the switch to start this activity it probably may happen today or monday uh, but we are taking this very seriously the meeting the minute this hearing is over i'm heading back up to our headquarters to and we everyone's waiting for me to get back there to figure out how we can start moving forward if on you're, if you're getting working. resistance from the law department or some other player it's like not, that just act it's it's not the just law act. department is just making sure that we have the infrastructure, laptops, for people to telework and work at home, they have to have access to some, believe it or not, do not have laptops or computers at home. And A so lot of logistics. Make sure I understand. we have the infrastructure for them to actually. Who's in charge of making sure that there's soap in every park's bathroom? Uh, that is our both the first deputy and our chief operating officer. Are we inventorying that? Are we, are we what's, the, what's our status today? Our status on basic supplies such as hand soap, uh, toilet paper, paper towels is, is very good. We do have concerns long term about disinfectant. As you know and have heard from press reports, uh, there is not a lot available on the market. We have a good store and supply right now. Uh, long term, we, are, we do have concerns about that. There are, there are really robust, intense deep cleaning protocols in place now in mass transit, in public schools. What about on parks, water fountains, on, play, on playground equipment? In terms of our water fountains, we're going to delay uh, turning those on. Typically, we do it next week. We're not going to do that until we get further instruction for the Department of Health, so we're putting turning our water fountains on hold. Our focus has been on interior spaces. We set out directives to staff about how often we'll be cleaning interior spaces, rec centers, bathrooms, work areas, 
All that protocol had been sent uh, earlier this week to all of staff, I'm sorry, last week to all of staff about what the cleaning protocol is going to be. But at this time, we're going to wait from guidance for the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene to determine how we should be handling outdoor facilities. Okay. I could go on and on and on. I'm just going to give one more question. The uh, PEP officers are emergency responders. Yes. Their role now is probably more critical than ever. The public's going to be turning to them uh, for assurance, uh, potentially for rescue. How are you re-envisioning the PEP officer role in this crisis? Well, right now, they continue to maintain their patrol about educating the public. They'll be out there in the field to assure the public. Uh, they've been instructed, like all of our staff, that we're encouraging New Yorkers to exercise social distancing, hygiene, personal hygiene, and so they're in communication with the rest of our command about what they should be doing. But again, we also want to make sure for the mayor's office, emergency management, we're also taking direction about ro what role they should play. Uh, and so we stand ready to implement whatever action protocol they'll be giving us. Right. The, the job of the PEP officers has changed today relative to two weeks ago. And you're going to need to review every aspect of equipment, of protocols, of messaging, of staff allocation. Uh, these, these, the, we're in an emergency, and these are emergency responders, and they, they are in the parks that we need to remain safe and comfortable for people. I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm just going to close and say that uh, if, if you care about this agency, I know you do. Those of us who care about this agency, those of us who care about public space and green space remaining available to the public in the midst of a crisis when it's arguably more necessary than ever are going to have to radically change our thinking about every aspect of operation in this system and every system in the city. Uh, and we, we need to pass a great budget. We need to fund everything that my colleagues are talking about. I'm glad they're carrying that because I can't today. but. Uh, but the, the, the world is changing right now for the indefinite future, and the Parks Department is not immune to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Yeah. Uh, now we go to Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, good to see you as always, and your team. Thank you for being here today. I will be brief. I just had uh, a follow-up question to uh, Councilmember Rivera, uh, who was asking about community gardens. I, too, uh, I'm concerned a, a bit about community gardens and the liability issue that has been put before them. Now, I understand from, uh, from one of our gardening groups, uh, apparently in the half that do object uh, to the document, that there were contradictions in the document and the, the document, the licensure document, perhaps contradicted a handbook that was given to them by Green Thumb. Can you address that? So yes, I can, and thank you, Councilwoman. Um, so w we would actually, I want to explain the difference between the license and the handbook very briefly, if I could. So uh, the license is, of course, a legal document that uh, you know, we want our licensed gardeners to sign that lays out the legal rights and responsibilities of the, gardener, of the garden groups vis-a-vis -vis the gardens on which they practice. In certain uh, elements of the license, it does refer to the handbook. The handbook is a more robust document. Uh, it is not a legal document. It is subject to changes. Uh, and it regards um, garden practice, garden best practices, how to plant, when to plant, uh, safest way to hold an event, et cetera. Uh, as far as uh, we have been able to determine, we have not been able to identify uh, inconsistencies between the license and the handbook. Now, uh, in conversation with the groups who have uh, had questions about the license or have resisted signing the license, uh, we have made some changes to the handbook uh, in order to clarify certain elements of the handbook. Indeed, one of these clarifications uh, was about how clarifications are made to the handbook and uh, giving uh, advance notice via email, uh, social media, and US mail about changes made to the handbook. Uh, but in direct answer to your question, no, uh, we are not aware of any direct uh, contradictions between the license and the handbook. 
Okay, I, I was um, informed that there was actually another document provided to Green Thumb that was rejected to take a look at some of the contradictions, but you're you not aware of that, so. So we have gotten uh, quite a few letters and documents and have been uh, you know, in conversation with both groups of gardens and individual gardens themselves uh, about uh, critiques to the license and uh, disagreements uh, with certain items in the handbook as well. Uh, so I, there are a lot of documents going around. I, I, I'm afraid I can't speak to sure. the exact one. Sure, yeah. Un understood, understood. My final point is uh, I understood you to say that the city can't provide insurance for individual groups. That was my other question on where the whole liability issue fell and why this would now fall on individuals and individual groups. Uh, I'm sure that... Uh, you look like you want to say something. Well, no, I just I, I, I do want to take the um, opportunity to contextualize a little bit, sure. uh, very briefly, about the issue of liability. So in previous licenses, uh, there was a clause that made it explicit that garden groups uh, were liable for what happened in the garden. In response to an unprecedented outreach effort to the gardens as we move forward to this most current license, we actually removed that clause. We lifted an explicit burden of liability. So these license, li licenses actually uh, have less of a liability burden on the gardens than the previous licenses. I'm hearing a little objection in the, in the ranks. Yes. I, will, I will just say this, and I will conclude with this, that I, I do hope that you continue your meetings with those that do object yes. uh, to this new, uh, this new policy, the licensure, and, and all of that, just to hear them out totally for complete fairness and transparency. And, and council member, before, before this hearing started, I was presented with a petition. Uh, there were conversations. Conversation had stopped for a while, and so we are open to restart those conversations again Great. so we can hear those that still have Terrific, concerns. terrific. I'm sure that everyone in the room is happy to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Moyer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, how are you, Commissioner? Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, one quick question, um, local one, Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, as you know, the November 2019 plan included 3.4 million in fiscal 2020 for capital improvements in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Uh, it was our understanding that the funding is part of an agreement with uh, the USTA uh, to commit 5 million in six installments to improve the park and to expand uh, the National Tennis Center in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Uh, can you share with the committee some uh, details on the planned capital improvements in Flushing Meadows Corona Park? for fiscal 2020 and 2021? Council Member, I want to be clear. Is this funds that went to the, the alliance of Fleshy Meta Corona Park? I'm just, there was an agreement uh, that there was an alliance, as me clarification about the USTA. Uh, I do know that as a result of that, there were some funds exp the, right. that were dedicated to the to creation the alliance. of the alliance. If that's the question, I can tell you how the Alliance has been assigning those dollars for capital improvements that I can yep. share with you. Uh, those funds are very restricted about what can be used. I served as chair of the Alliance up until this year. Uh, they've been purchasing vehicles. It's very limited about what it can and cannot purchase. I don't know specifically what it was, but it did fall within the guidelines that it went from one amount and then decreased over years. They're now in their decreased level. Uh, but because it's not a significant amount, it's over a 20-year period, uh, that they've been able to partially purchase uh, what we call the Gator uh, and some other uh, more capital items um, that were eligible for capital. But in terms of paying for any major capital improvements such as sites or buildings, there weren't enough funds to cover that. So they focused on more on the equipment side that was capitally eligible. And is there uh, somewhere where we can see what was spent Oh, absolutely. Uh, you could actually go online in the Alliance, okay. and if not, you could speak to the administrator. Uh, as chair, we detailed uh, every step, how that money was spent. Because it was restricted, uh, as chair, I would tell our board members what could and could not be spent with this money. Uh, the concern is now decreased for a lower amount, and so now it's going to propel the Alliance to do a lot more fundraising, since, again, these are allotments over a long period of time. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Joyner. Thank you, Chair. Good to see you again, Commissioner. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's a new day uh, with crisis and chaos, which is going to force many of our departments and agencies to rethink the future and the possibility that uh, the budget may not be uh, what we once hoped it would be. In that process, and knowing how the, the cost of capital projects and reconstruction, I've presented this to you before, and I use Orchard Beach as a prime example. We have a $71 million project ongoing there, and that's only for phase one and several other phases thereafter. Parks Department should be looking at RFPs for concessions so that we can save taxpayer dollars, or put this into the hands of businesses, which we value, so a partnership of government and um, business approach, private and public funds, where they can make the investments that are needed and maintain those properties. We need to rethink all of our capital projects where we can use concessions as a means to save taxpayer dollars and invest those very valuable and limited resources in other areas. Is there any movement on this discussion uh, from our last time that we met? In terms of the Orchard Beach specifically, uh, there are concessions there, smaller concessions, and there will be an opportunity for other concessions in the future. A lot of it has to do with the amount of capital they want to invest, and since our agreement is done by terms, they'd have to amortize that investment so this business decision makes sense. Uh, someone's not going to want to invest $20, $30 million and figure out how that pencils out for them to recoup that dollars o over the term of the agreement. But we are always looking for opportunities for concessionaires. We have 400 concessions in New York City that generate between 60 and $65 million that goes into the general fund. And so for us, it is beneficial and wise for us to explore those opportunities and we do every year we find out where it makes sense and Orchard Beach is going to have quite a few. Uh, it may be seasonal, not sure if it's going to be year-round based on its location, but it's something that our team is looking at as the Orchard Beach project evolves. Right. Thank you, Commissioner. And that's where I'm headed with this. Orchard Beach offers parking for thousands of cars. Phase two is a major development that if we came up with a concession with a long-term understanding that that's going to be considerable amount of time before the businesses can actually benefit from it. It's heavy, it's high investment uh, moving into it, but an arena of a sort or a sports complex that can be used year round where that parking is year round available is a missed opportunity. That concession can build a major portion of phase two, which is in the tens of millions of dollars, where we can alleviate using these taxpayer dollars and put it into the hands of business. I, I'm hopeful that we can look at this from a bigger picture perspective instead of the individual concessions and the minor investments that they uh, will be making into opening up. We're looking at big picture. If you're talking stadium level, it's at another realm. Uh, I certainly don't mind sitting down with you and going over the details because when you do something, that's now when you start looking at uh, a stadium, it, it's on another level that we certainly have to tell you what is involved in building, whether it's a USTA or a city field. I'm not sure exactly what the scale is, but when we look at a concession that at the maximum has 20 years, how much does someone want to invest so that they can recoup that cost over that period? And if someone's going to invest something a level of 50, $100 million, they're going to have to find out how they're going to get paid back. And yes, there's a lot of parking. Uh, we are exploring as a concept some type of larger concession on one side of Orchard Beach, uh, but not to the level that you're talking about. But certainly we can sit down with our concession team to go over the numbers so you'll understand we have to scale a concession based upon the term of the agreement and how much they rec recoup to make this project work. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, with the little bit of time that I have, I just want to touch on a few things. New York, um, the Bronx has the largest park of them all, Pelham Bay Park. I need a breakdown on headcount compared to the other boroughs. 
as well as the uh, tree pruning stump removal program, the share by borough. Uh, we're nowhere near where we need to be. We have so much more work to do. Um, and my community has been asking for tree pruning, and they've been on this long-awaited list. The borough of the Bronx, a few years back, was one of the few boroughs that received no tree pruning, and we're trying to remake or catch up to that demand. Uh, and the last question is PEP officers. We're in the middle of a budget. Now more than ever, PEP officers are needed. And this should be a baseline increase in our budget for PEP officers, and not just the two shifts that they are currently doing because may, most of our issues and complaints are at night with the homelessness, homeless crisis where they've taken over parks and have created and there are security concerns in and around our parks. We need three tours of PEP officers out there. They are our first line of defense when it comes to our parks department. This should not be the burden on the NYPD. We should baseline the funding that's needed to match the need of PEP officers for all of our parks. There isn't a council member that is happy with the number of PEP officers. We know that we've increased it. We just need more, whether it be fighting barbecuing or illegal activities or summons during the day, we need them equally on that third shift at night. And I just can't help but give a shout out to my own commissioner, Iris Rodriguez Rosa. She's awesome. I'll touch on a couple of them. We agree with you, the value our PEP officers offer to this city. Uh, and this is something, as we continue the conversation, we were very pleased with the Playfair uh, one shot. And we hope as this conversation continues, uh, we can continue servicing the city with our amazing PEP. On the park maintenance side, I can give you the numbers, not per park, but certainly by borough. And so it fluctuates. Uh, Bronx is between 677 and 875, both peak and off-peak, Brooklyn is 928 to 1287, Manhattan 805 to 1034, Queens 888 to 1003, and Staten Island 345 to 457. Uh, again, that's between peak and off-peak. If you want me to come back with you specifically with Pelham Bay, uh, we can certainly get you that number specifically for that park. And the tree? Tree stand. Uh, Council Member, we, we have had a, uh, a regular tree and stump removal program for years. Uh, the Bronx receives a proportionate share of the funding and, and commensurate with the size of the tree population. There has been pruning in the Bronx every year of this administration. Um, I believe in 2017, the borough of the Bronx did not receive, or 2017 or 18, I can't recall now, the Bronx did not receive the tree pruning services that it needed, um, and it was due to budget constraints. Uh, unless I'm... Uh, Council, I'm not aware of any budget constraints. This is a program that has been running very effectively for uh, a number of years now, certainly in the entirety of, the, uh, of this administration. But I will uh, provide you with the specifics for what happened each year in the Bronx. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, yeah. we actually have those Hi. numbers. It seems like okay, yeah. we have the numbers, but there's been on average we don't see a dip. Uh, it's been seven thousand over seven thousand for FY17, over seven thousand for FY18. So it's showing that uh, there was no reduction in service for tree for the tree pro pruning program. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner, at the last budget adoption. The council negotiated with the administration to provide over $90 million for 300 uh, park maintenance workers uh, consisting of 200 city park workers and 100 gardeners. Please help the committee understand the importance of these workers to park maintenance. We're always thankful for additional park workers and by all of our metrics, uh, all of our additional workers are making a difference. Uh, we've seen our ratings meet or exceed the mayor's management target. It's always good to be able to deploy and focus on hotspots. If you recall, a few years ago, uh, with the additional staff, we were able for the first time as uh, in Parks Department, we actually had cleaning seven days a week. 
uh, by addressing some of the top hot spots throughout the city. So staff was able to clean on weekends, so it would be clean when it was at the peak uh, visitation from our park users. So it's been very invaluable to have additional staff to maintain our park system. It's something I welcome, but I also know it's also subject to budget consultations. But I can tell you personally of the valuable, invaluable service of all of our park employees to help keep our parks clean and safe. So how is this additional staff uh, distributed across the city? And what distribution, uh, what distribution strategy does the department use? Well, for one, uh, we had a lot of consul consultation about what made sense. We were guided largely by our PIP ratings. These are our inspection ratings to determine which parks need the most help and uh, generally signed by fixed post at specific areas. Gardeners will be part of borough-wide crews, but the way the distribution worked uh, in the Bronx got 23%, I'm sorry, 15% of 23 individuals, Brooklyn, 41, Manhattan, 29, Queens, 35, Staten Island, 10. We also deployed nine to our rec centers, one to our arts and antiquities team, and then a Stark House Trust got one for a total of 150. So this is how we're able to deploy them, but we sat down, communicated this also with the Playfair uh, advocates so they understood how we're going to distribute these resources. We also looked at the metrics to see what impact they've had. So all of this has been positive uh, and a great addition to both New York City and of course to our park system. So half of these additional 300 park maintenance workers are funded for only one year in fiscal 2020. Can you tell the committee what happens to those 150 maintenance workers come July 1st? Uh, if the non-baseline funding of $9.6 million is not restored, what well, would be the impact on parks maintenance? Well, as in years past, uh, we're always able to work effect effectively with the staff that we have. This process is ongoing. We'd like to hold on to every employee as possible, but there's also a budget process that is ongoing, and that will, of course, continue. Uh, we watch very carefully about where we could continually keep our rankings up through our parks inspection, through the mayor's management report. Prior to the 150, we met or exceeded the mayor's targets. We will continue to look how, with the reduction of forces, we can still meet or exceed those management report targets. So w what is the training process like uh, for new seasonal hires or temporary workers? And how long is it, and how often does the agency have to do this kind of training? Uh, it is a lot shorter. I'm going to defer to uh, the first deputy commissioner, but yes, for our seasonals, there is some training involved in the maintenance and care of our parks. Council member, it varies depending on the title that the person uh, is, 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 is placed in and the, the assignment. Uh, but everyone gets training in all of the standard uh, parks and recreation, uh, uh, standard operating procedures, uh, all of the personnel rules and regulations. Uh, they get training in vehicle operation, in small equipment uh, operation and maintenance, uh, in the standards that we apply to all of our facilities. It's an extensive package, but given that they are seasonal workers, it probably lasts a total of about two weeks. In addition to that, uh, they do receive uh, on-the-job training from their colleagues and supervisors who are explicitly uh, uh, assigned the responsibility for developing their skills uh, and making them into effective employees. Thank you. Do you consider current total headcount um, enough, is enough to ensure that all council districts are being sufficiently and equally served? And what are the metrics that you use to come up with that determination? Council Member, as a commissioner, I will accept as many employees as possible. We all put them to productive use. Uh, but regardless of what our staffing level is, uh, we look very carefully at our PIP inspection ratings, as well as the mayor's management targets to ensure we're meeting or exceeding clean parks, general condition for our parks. So as our staff fluctuates, we meet on a monthly basis to make sure how do we meet those targets. And so that is something I'm committed to doing as well as all of our, from the first deputy commissioner to our chief operating officer and borough commissioners, this is something we meet on a monthly basis to ensure we're meeting those targets. So as we see a reduction in ranks, 
we still have to strategize about how we continue to meet those goals, and we are meeting those goals year after year. Uh, can you explain why all eligible pig ones are not staffed with a Paul Grant associate? In terms of the playgrounds, I know growing up we're all used to that playground associate in the playground. Uh, most of our parks are cleaned by mobile crews. Uh, we do not have the resources. I think we have a thousand playgrounds. Uh, it would be a very different approach going forward to have a park worker in each one of those uh, playgrounds. We have moved to a model now where we have mobile crews that will go in and care for those public spaces. There are some parks that does have a playground associate associated with the comfort station, but right now there is not the budget to have a playground associate in each and every one of our playgrounds. Uh, going back on the, the metrics you used to uh, inspect all the playgrounds or all the parks, you said overall uh, rating is 88% or something, right? Just give me one second. So in terms of park cleanliness, the condition and cleanliness of our parks, uh, of course, is our top priority. And according to this year's preliminary MMR, New York City Parks has been rated consistently over 90% for our cleanliness. Mm. So who, who gave you those, those ratings? Some agency or? No, some we have a, an some audit third party division. agency? Or? Yes. So we have a parks inspection unit that mm. is separate from maintenance and operations. Mm. And they basically are auditors. They conduct 6,000 detailed inspections each year, and that information is compiled. And then as a management team, we come together once a month to review those inspections. And if we could determine parks that are not doing well, we have to make some kind of change and determine what's going wrong so we can rectify it. So that is pretty accurate, and that's how we focus. And it's very detailed, whether it's playground equipment, pavement, graffiti, glass, uh, waste from animals, uh, and we determine how well this park is rating, and then we sit down with the borough commissioners and chief of operations, and we discuss exactly what we need to do. So this is done every single month, and that's why we're able to make sure we meet those targets. Uh, how do you ensure that all the bathrooms in the parks or big ones are, uh, have soap and toilet paper? Soap is really important. Wash the hands, no? even today, extra important. Yeah. Uh, that's part of the inspection as well, uh, that the inspectors will go out, go into the bathroom, determine the toilet, the soap, is it clean? So that's also part of the inspection of those 6,000 that I mentioned uh, earlier. If a park user go, uh, uh, goes into a bathroom and find to no toilet paper, does he or she has a remedy to call somebody, hey, bring some bathroom papers, or, or if they have no soap, in, that, in the dispenser. We have protocol how about how often both toilet and soap is the, the bathrooms are serviced. That should not happen. If it does happen, we would have to tell them to call the agency or call 311. That is unacceptable. It is our goal to make sure the bathrooms have both soap, what it needs to function for the public. Yeah. Because personally, when I go to the park and I went in the bathroom, usually they are not up to the standard, you know, because they have water all over the floor because nobody mopped the floor there. And when people wash their hands and they just drip all the water on the floor. We have standards about how often those comfort stations are cleaned. Uh, anything like that, of course, is unacceptable, but based on our inspections, we're not finding that. If it's so, it is noted. And then we talk to uh, the supervisor uh, to ensure that that gets rectified. Maybe we can use some like, outside agency to like, outside groups, like secret shoppers, right? Hire some senior, uh, senior volunteers. They, they can do the rating for you. Uh, we have, basically, yeah. within our agency, it's like an audit division. They're separate from maintenance yeah, and operations. Separate. They yeah. report to someone different. So they actually are the outside secret shoppers. And as a commissioner, I'm also a secret shopper that I'm known to go to parks uh, off duty to inspect them myself. And yes, there are visits to conference stations so I can see firsthand. And I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, literally, all have been in very good condition. Yeah, and staff is aware I do make these I, I secret shopper choice. visits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I have two more sets of questions. Uh, 
so at the last budget adoption of the council, the council provided $5.1 million for past equity initiative, of which the majority of the funding supports efforts to do programming in small neighborhood parks. Can you provide the committee with a status update on the impact of this initiative on parks programming? Well, we're very pleased that from your funding, uh, one is that based upon my notes, it was 5.8 million that had 312 discretionary allocation, uh, about 3.4 as an active third party awards, uh, and 91% are nearing the contracting phase. 2.2 million directly to parks, uh, nearly all on their way to implementation, contributing to dozens of movie nights, family fun days, playground associates, as well as field and court improvements. Also, uh, we were able to fully fund eight staff members through partnership for parks to work on technical issues and assistance teams with a lot of our parks groups. So this money was put to good use, and uh, we, are, we want to thank you for making that contribution because it's been a valuable addition uh, to working with our partners. So today is the program uh, meeting is intended goals of an enhancing programming in smaller parks. And what indicators are you using? Well, what one, we those? have serviced in our parks in general 1.9 million children, both through the council programs, through our public programs. We try to activate our parks as much as possible. We also work with Partnership for Parks on a number of events. So we know that activating parks is the best way to keep our parks safe. Good uses tend to push out bad uses. And so for us, having these social gathering events, of course, we're gonna have to change our protocol going forward, help provide a great experience for New Yorkers. So this is something we find extremely valuable. Uh, as chair of the committee, I would like to encourage the department to do more programs involving youngsters and uh, adults for physical exercise, exercise. because they, in the general public now, uh, many, many reports say that almost half of the population is obese or near obese, no? So, uh, and you are, uh, in general, people are obese, they will, we have to pay their bills when they go to emergency rooms or hospital stays. Um, and so it would be uh, uh, nice that the department create more outdoor activities to encourage youngsters to come in and either do whatever, uh, right. physical exercise and yeah. dances or all these things, and especially some senior, senior citizens to encourage them to walk, do to their daily walking, 10,000 steps or 15,000 steps a day, all those things, and they have some rewards for them. Council Member, I agree with you. In light of the current epidemic, we are yeah. just taking a pause until we make sure as we ramp up our programming going forward, we'll be taking guidance from the Department of Mental Health about how we're gonna program our activities in the future, but putting, uh, but clearly there's no question, uh, the Parks Department has a history of providing program shape up specifically for seniors, walking groups, uh, we have kids in motion for our children. We understand the importance of having healthy New Yorkers and parks is one of the main destinations for that. Uh, the last question is on past security. The fiscal 2021 preliminary uh, capital commitments include $27 million for past security, uh, past security measures citywide. Can you provide the committee with some details on this project? We know that three sites are already active. What is the scheduled completion date for these sites? Uh, in terms of the security measures, this is ongoing analysis. This is a result of unfortunate uh, potential security measures of vehicles that could get access to our parks and create harm. We're examining some of our more high profile parks. That work is underway about how we can secure those parks from vehicles entering the parks and creating harm to our park goers and our visitors. So that right now is ongoing. We can come back to you once we have a more specific example, but there are locations, hot spots, so to speak, where we're looking to put in some security measures to prevent vehicles from accessing public areas. 
So how many more sites will this entire project include? We're working with NYPD and Homeland, our own Homeland Security to determine what are the proper locations. We do have them. Uh, and so we can talk to you specifically where they are. Uh, if you notice, for example, Times Square is a location that has been secured. We have other uh, big destinations uh, that would, Coney Island and others that we want to make sure are secured for the public to enjoy without the threat of any terrorist incident. Uh, any questions from our members? No, seeing none. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Now we go to public participation. Uh, due to the uh, the amount of people want to speak, so everyone is limited to uh, two minutes each. The first panel will be Emily Walker, uh, New Yorkers for part, uh, Julie Tai, uh, New NYLCU, and Heather. Nuba, City Pass Foundation. You may uh, start. Uh, please identify yourself first. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Walker, and I am the Director of Outreach and Programs for New Yorkers for Parks. Our organization is a founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which now includes over 230 organizations from every corner of New York City. Many of our coalition partners are here with us today, both virtually and in person, to testify about the importance of adequately funding our parks. And we thank the City Council Committee on Parks and Recreation for inviting us to speak about the FY20 prelimin FY21 preliminary budget. Last year, the City Council and Mayor made a historic investment of $44 million to increase the expense budget for NYC parks as a result of our coalition's advocacy. This additional funding was just a start, however, toward addressing decades of chronic disinvestment in our city's park system. Today, we urge you not to not just preserve last year's hard-fought funding, but to continue to fight for additional resources for NYC parks. To that end, today we are asking the city to commit an additional $200 million to the preliminary budget for parks in FY21 a $100 million increase in the expense budget, and a $100 million increase in the capital budget. NY4P and the Playfair Coalition firmly believe that now is the time for the city to invest in both the infrastructure of our parks and the people that keep them clean, safe, and beautiful. Now is the time to play fair for parks. The most critical need is to make the 342 jobs created by last year's funding from the council permanent. We believe these positions should be baselined by the administration as it's unfair for the neighborhoods citywide who are now seeing the results and benefits of these increased staff to lose those benefits and it is unfair to the hardworking New Yorkers that now fill these parks positions. For the second year, we are also asking for funding to place more fixed post crews at all eligible NYC parks properties and to expand the zone management program to serve more of our city's largest parks. Um, our Playfair Coalition's new expense asks center on meeting the chronic maintenance and operations needs of our parks and gardens. 
We support funding pathways to create permanent employment. Um, I'm gonna race through this. I do wanna note that last year, the council funded historic improvements and resources for community gardens citywide. This was an important and necessary first step intended to benefit all community gardens and gardeners who help build healthier neighborhoods across the city. We call on the city to maintain this investment, but also ask that this funding truly reach every community garden, regardless of license status. Community gardeners have helped create resilient neighborhoods for decades and their work deserves recognition and investment. Um, I will end quickly to say that the full details of our ask are in our um, written testimony, but I believe now more than ever, our parks are, are going to become a more pressing resources for neighborhoods as we face this public health crisis and we ask the council to stand with us today in pushing for a $200 million addition to the budget. Thank you. We have your full testimony here. Yeah. So uh, next we'll... Am I on now? Here we go. Uh, good, good afternoon. My name is Julie Tai. I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, we represent over 31,000 members in New York City, and we're committed to advancing a sustainability agenda to make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. And thank you, Chair Ku, uh, for the opportunity to testify before the committee on the fiscal 2021 20 budget. Um, I want to start by saying thank you. Last year, you provided a $44 million increase to parks, uh, providing job certainty for, uh, for over 150 park workers, adding PEP officers and urban rangers, and making investments in parks in all five boroughs. And we heard some of the great results of that during Commissioner Silver's testimony. Um, this year, as uh, Emily noted, uh, in the second year of the Playfair campaign, our coalition is asking for the city to commit $200 million in additional funding for the Parks Department, uh, $100 million for the expense budget and the capital budget. Um, we know that the mayor has identified in one NYC a um, great number of environmental, transportation, and public health priorities, and our city is staring down a crisis of ex existential importance on top of the current public health crisis, and it's incumbent upon our elected, least, elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action and solutions. The city's parks department plays a critical role in that fight. Um, we know that the parks and green spaces are really the city's most valuable assets uh, from the environment. They provide the urban tree canopy, uh, which mitigates climate change, provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributes to the well-being of our residents and our economy and preserving these spaces is a top priority for us. Uh, the 2.6 million trees and parks uh, that, this, that the Parks Department is responsible for remove 1,300 tons of pollutants from the atmosphere and store 1 million tons of carbon each year. They are vital for mitigating the urban heat island effect and can lower temperatures by up to 9 degrees, cutting air conditioning use by 30%, and reducing heating energy use by a further 20 to 50%. The New York City's parks also contribute to our resiliency by capturing more than two, million, two billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Um, park records, parks use is surging to record levels and we don't expect that that's going to slow down even despite this current crisis. Um, so we're proud to be members of this coalition again. As we mentioned, um, there's more details of what our campaign is asking for in our budget, um, but we certainly want to make sure that we're baselining those employees that were added last year, adding additional staff, uh, making sure that we are dedicating funding for the, uh, the, the framework, the forest framework management plan, um, and providing the critical capital needs that are available. So we would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Heather Lubov. I'm the head of City Parks Foundation. We are a private nonprofit organization that works closely with the Parks Department to bring programming to New Yorkers in their parks all throughout the city. And in particular, we work closely with the agency on partnerships for parks. Um, I think we all agree that our city's parks are our most fundamentally democratic public spaces. Um, so we reach 310,000 New Yorkers of all ages every year through Summer Stage, the Swedish Cottage Marionette Theater, the Puppet Mobile, free sports programming, environmental education programming, and of course, partnerships for parks. Everything we do is centered on the fact that parks are important centers of community. So I want to let everyone know that our staff and board are deeply committed to resuming our free programs in parks as soon as we possibly can, because we think that those free programs will be increasingly relied upon during difficult times. Um, Chairman, you had mentioned the Parks Equity Initiative. It has allowed us to expand our free arts, sports, and educational programming. 
Um, we have added 12 partially funded staff members to Partnerships for Parks. We've added seniors fitness sites. We've added new sports programs for kids. We've added two after school environmental education programs. We've been able to bring more prominent artists to summer stage and we've uh, expanded Partnerships for Parks to support all of the community volunteers with whom we work through workshops, through small grants, through visioning programs, through mentorship, and through the Catalyst Intensive Program, which is mentioned in the Commissioner's uh, testimony. We continue to see a demand, uh, our demand increase for volunteer projects across the city, which makes the Parks Equity Initiative particularly important. Last summer, thanks to capital funding from the Council, we opened our newly refurbished summer stage at Rumsey Playfield in Central Park. And so we really appreciate the city's continued partnership on this important program as we continue to improve our venue and provide diverse performing arts programming all free of charge. Most importantly though, we're a proud member of the Playfair Coalition, so we ask the city to continue investing in our public parks and green spaces. Thank you. Thank you for all your advocacy. Okay. So we have a next group. Are there any questions for them? Thank you. The next group will be Joe Polio, Marlena Giga, Marlena Giga, and Stacy Guande, and Wow Basilis, Wow uh, Basilis from Local 983. Yeah. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, yeah. Chair Koo and the rest of the City Council people. Happy Friday, the 13th. Thank you. Okay, um, I know you have a lot of difficult tasks, a lot of difficult decisions to make, uh, and I appreciate all the good work that you've done in the past. Okay, it is critical that we don't lose any PEP officers. So the ones that we currently have from the last budget, the 80 plus the 50 Rangers, it is key, it is essential that we do not lose them. Again, this does not solve the problem, right? Um, they barely, you know, um, uh, are able to get out into the field. It takes three months, as you heard, for the Parks Department to train these individuals. A lot of these people are still in the academy. They're not even ha have their foot on the ground yet. And for them to be in job je jeopardy is, is ludicrous. We need to expand our numbers. If you look at NYPD, they have 28, excuse me, 38,000 police officers. They have 4,500 auxiliary police officers. School safety, there's 5,000 of them in the schools of New York City. And we have approximately 3,000 traffic agents. We have 250 PEP officers. We have 3,000, over 3,000 acres of parkland. We have over 5,000 buildings that the Parks Department operates. And these numbers um, cannot, cannot continue to adequately keep people safe in these parks and in these facilities. And once the summer comes, all our resources are deployed to the pools and beaches. I, again, I appreciate all your efforts, but again, we need thousands, not hundreds of these individuals. Okay, and I, know, and I know I'm talking to our friends and you guys have been, again, wonderful, but we need to really make these changes, especially now in these times where we're, we're involved in a pandemic. Um, you know, we need these people. They cannot work from home. We hear a lot of this work from home during this crisis. Guess what? These individuals can work from home. You cannot do enforcement at home. You know, you need them out in the field. You need to keep them, to keep the uh, park safe they are first responders. I hear the word eyes and ears. Well, guess what? When you're involved in an incident, you have to respond. They are peace officers. They affect arrests. They don't call the cops, you know, and say, here, I got a bad person. They affect it. They go to the precincts. They process it. And I don't want to take up more time. Thank you, yeah. Quick, but I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Marlena Giga. I've been a PEP officer for 20 years. Um, and the 
PEP offices and the ranges have, have been on the front line of New York City in many aspects. We were 9-11, we were responders, the plane crash on the Hudson, we responded, the retaining wall uptown, um, and also the terrorist attack on the West Side Highway. It was a parks officer that first called that incident in. Um, we respond to any end calls to protect New York City, putting our own safety before the public. Our officers are law enforcement officers, not eyes and ears. We make arrests for anything from illegal vending to assault, just to name a few. Unfortunately, morale is at, at an all-time low because of the working conditions, the lack of commands, the space, the overcrowding, the lack of vehicles, and the current salary is at $50,000. We have an extremely high turnover rate, and the administration does not also back their offices when they do their job. This is why the attrition will not change. Please help us support our offices. The parks will fail if no one is making sure they are safe. Um, I'm proudly from the Bronx. We have the highest park land, as you listen to the testimony. We have the lowest amount of parks personnel, including PEP and maintenance. So we have to do better. Um, I want to make it cl clear that we do not patrol with NYPD. It, and it's a slap in the face to constantly hear that. While on patrol, whatever we see, we take action and we make the arrest ourselves. Um, we would also um, like to ask for more money in the budget for maintenance, APSWs. The Parks Department is constantly outsourcing. Um, our employees can do this ourselves. And as far as city seasonal aids, we'd like to have a city seasonal aid in each park. Thank you. Next, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Ralph Basilis. I've been a parks enforcement officer for 15 years, and I just want to touch on the fact that we're always played down as eyes and ears. That is completely not the case. In my own personal experiences, I've responded to domestic violence in the parks, to attempted rapes, to successful rapes, um, vandalism. During Hurricane Sandy, folks were scrapping out in Rockway Beach. They had us making arrests, scrapping people. We are not just eyes and ears, and we're constantly, constantly downplayed, and we're being told, oh, they're eyes and ears, they don't handle this. When major companies do construction within the park, they cause damage when there's illegal tree cuts. You know who they send? off of parks property to serve the summonses, they send park rangers. That's not quality of life issues. Not to mention, any quality of life issue has the potential to raise to a felony level. There's derelict vehicles in the park. We go and check those. Guess what? That's Grand Theft Auto. We have to figure out, you know, contact uh, towing, get rid of them. I'm just here to speak on behalf of all the urban park rangers citywide, like, like my partners here. The job is constantly downplayed. We need more park rangers, we need more vehicles, and we need more money. Their salary needs to raise. They are dealing with so much stuff that somehow is, is masked and, and it goes under the carpet. Intentional or not, it's happening. Parks Department needs to hire more PEP, more money, and more vehicles. Thank you. Next, please. Thanks, Dan. Hi, my name is Stacy Granda. I am a gardener one at Fort Tryon Park. I'm actually one of the 50 new gardeners that were hired this year, so I'm very grateful for the budget, and I'm grateful for all the amazing gardeners that are part of our New York City Park system. Um, we do play an a very vital role because aside from being, being a general presence in the park, we do keep a lot of spaces clean. As mentioned earlier, um, we take spaces that are just weed infested, complete eyesores, um, potential for being health hazards due to rats and dumping, and we turn them into beautiful spaces that is used by the public, add economic value to nearby houses, and it's just something a lot of New Yorkers really do enjoy. Um, I would like to ask to keep the baseline for gardeners that we have now and possibly add more. Um, we have, as we said earlier, 14% of the lands are being taken care of, a very limited amount of gardeners. Um, it's important to keep in mind is when we complete a project, um, create a new garden, these things need to be cared for in the long term. 
the growing season does seem to end at the winter, but we're always staying busy. We're always planning ahead. We're very skilled workers. We've taken so many classes to prepare for the next growing season. Um, and gardeners are just something that people do not think much of um, until summer comes and everything's in full swing. Um, so us gardeners do love our jobs. Um, and we want to keep on providing New York City very clean, adequate, beautiful spaces everyone can enjoy. Thank you. We are also joined by Daniel Clay, uh, President of Local 1547, DC37. Thank you. Hi there, Chairman Ku again. Hi again. Hi, everybody else. Um, yes, I'm Daniel Clay. Uh, um, I'm a gardener of 15 years now for New York City and I'm very, very proud to represent our local and, and our staff. And I'd like to thank you guys for all, all that you've done um, in baselining our, our last 50 provisional gardeners and the, the additional staff, as well as everything else to the green thumb workers and everything else you've done. And um, I'd like to um, ask that you do even more because there's so much to do out there. There are plantings and parks and underserved communities that just look drab and, and woodlands that, that so quickly fill up with thorny vines and poison ivy and garbage and rats. And um, we gardeners and just all the boots on the ground were spread so thin in the 30, 39,000 acres of parkland. And there's just a tremendous amount of work to do that we love doing. And um, And um, yeah, so just like to thank you, and and, and uh, hope, hope, hopefully things get better in the future. All right, thanks again. I, yeah, I have a question. I have a question for the uh, PEP officers. Um, you heard the commissioner say that um, you handle quality of life. Now, are you told that if you see a crime in progress, to back off and call the police? So. Because we're special patrolmen and peace, peace officers, that is absolutely not the case. No matter what it is that is going on, if we are called there by central communications or we happen to be on patrol and we see a crime taking place, we must take action. So, so you must take action and you're in harm's way. Um, so you're not told to call the police or as ba for backup, you, you, you have to take action. If you see vandalism, if you see somebody lighting a fire or anything, uh, or you know, vandalizing play equipment uh, in, in progress, you act. We, and we take action, absolutely. If there's a, a safety issue where there's multiple people involved, a crowd involved, then in that case, we may call for additional units and for NYPD. Okay. I just want to say that the PEP officers are 24-hour peace officers, so whether or not in pursuant to their duties, they still can affect arrests. And again, when they are first responders, they have to handle that situation at hand. If, if there is a need for NYPD where firearms, for, for example, are involved, they do call for backup and NYPD does respond. Again, uh, they are proactive, not reactive. When NYPD uh, usually interferes, interferes in, well, intervenes, I should say, it's usually because they are called upon and then leave the scene. So even if you're, let's say you're on your way home and you see something, a crime in progress, you're told to take action? Well, we have the powers to. You take have action. the power, but does, it, does that happen? As, as 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 it has happened, and as peace officers, we do have a moral obligation right. to intervene. Yes. Right. So, did you take offense to that remark about quality of life? That you, that's what well, you're doing. Well, I think the intent is the quality of life, and that's what Parks. That's the intent, but did that, you but take the reality? I felt. I feel that you guys are don't yeah, like that comment. What, what, what happens is because what they do on a day-to-day -day basis involves more than that and I think they feel like they're downplayed into thinking this is what they're limited to and it's not the case that um, in fact like for example during 9-11 during Sandy they were actually there and they had to take action right there at the moment's notice. They had no time to think or call other people they just intervened and they were there to help you know okay. uh, you know the people that right. are in parks. Right. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you.
All the best. The next group is uh, first is Roseanne Delgado, friends of Pelham Parkway, Scott Daly, New York Junior Tennis, Eva McPherson uh, from Green Dump, and Maureen Kelly from La Plaza Cultural. Please identify yourself and start. Yeah. Yes, hello, Chair. My name is Roxanne Delgado with Go Friends ahead. of Pelham Parkway. I'd like to say when I was sitting down, I heard your words like okay. parks receives less than half percent or one percent of the city budget yep. for maintenance and operation, yet it receives over four percent for capital uh, uh, budgeting. And yet, in the Commissioner Silver stated that in renovated parks, they receive increase of 50 percent uh, usage. So that means to me we're getting less uh, percent-wise for the budget for uh, operation maintenance, and we're receiving more uh, usage of parks. And that already is an issue. Just the number itself. You don't even have to look at any parks or any pictures. Anyone who analyzes that number knows that we're heading towards the wrong direction. The mayor and OMB, and I know we have the, the city council support, mostly of the city council, we appreciate that, but we need the mayor and OMB to step up. Because we cannot continue going playing this game every year. Everyone wants to save the world, which is great. I love saving the planet, but no one wants to take care of their own parks, and that's the issue. If you can't even take care of your own parks, you're not in the business of saving this planet. And second, uh, com um, Chair Parks, I'd like to say, regarding the 311 complaints, it does go to uh, central communication. The issue is not that it doesn't go. It takes over 72 hours before they receive it, and sends it, before 311 process it, and sends it to uh, wherever parks unit, whether it's park enforcement or maintenance, it takes over 72 hours. Now, it's okay if it's a, a dirty bench, but when it comes to illegal barbecuing or someone driving a motorbike in the parks, that has to be addressed on a timely manner. And NYPD is not of any assistance. They do respond to crimes of violence, but when it comes to like quality of life issues like illegal barbecuing, fireworks, um, large gathering, they will not address it. I, I try calling them directly myself. Uh, they say they have other issues to deal with. Now, regarding, um, I'm sorry, regarding upkeep, Yes, they do upkeep equipment, but not, they're not upkeeping the trees. And equipment can always be replaced. Trees cannot be replaced. The lack of upkeep on our trees is very sad, not just in the Bronx, citywide. And uh, regarding Orchard Beach, I'm 100% guess concession stands in Orchard Beach because like the uh, chair said, we do have an issue with obesity. Unfortunately, the Bronx is 62. So we need less food in the park. Actually, concession stands actually are, are negative in the parkland. They actually cost more money, uh, taxpayers subsidizing on upkeeping these uh, trash um, and the rats issue that comes with a concession stance. We need, we can't make money out of parks. If you want to make money out of parks, we really lost the battle. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Koo, Councilman Beholden. Um, my name is Scott Daly. I'm the Senior Director of the New York Junior Tennis and Learning Free Tennis Program for kids and teens throughout the five boroughs of the City of New York. I'm here to support the parks in any way I possibly can. We service NYJTL through the parks. We are located in 27 different parks. We run programs that run from eight weeks to 20 weeks. We run all four seasons of the year. We are indoors at the National Tennis Center. We have parks in the Bronx from Cretona to Williamsbridge to Brooklyn to McDonald's to Sparandeo in Manhattan, Seward Park, Jackie Robinson, over there in Queens, um, Juniper Valley, Forest Park, and the list goes on and on and on, Pominock Park. We couldn't do this without the support of the City Council. We have asked for this year in our applications to the city, $1.2 million. We have been receiving, for the last 13 years, we have been receiving $800,000. Go back that far, you will realize that at that time in 2008, budgets were cut all over the place. We are seeking a restoration. We, hit, we service over 85,000 kids a year. Uh, we need the money. Back in 2008, the minimum wage was $6.50. Now, I have to pay everybody $15 just to start. 
again, we are seeking that restoration, and we would do, we'd be grateful for anything you can do. Obviously, we want to hold on what we have. We need your help. We'll give additional hours. There'll be additional programming. You have my full testimony up there. I'll gladly answer any questions, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. No question. Next, please. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ku, for having me here. I do not have a prepared statement. I am uh, just a community gardener uh, from Bedford Stuyvesant. I've been gardening for the last 25 years. I'm in four gardens in Bedford Stuyvesant. I'm on the chair on the parks uh, committee. I advocate for community gardeners. And I am here in support of strengthening the budget for Green Thumb. Uh, Green Thumb was created in the 70s to address and attend to the issues of stakeholder gardeners that have created this movement. Before Liz Christie, believe it or not, in the 60s, 50s, and um, we've come a long way, and <laughs> we take credit for how the agency has bloomed and blossomed, and we would like that to continue. Um, there are issues on the record we want to state with the new licensing agreement that we are not in agreement with, and we want the record to state that we are in support of working with the agency to address those issues. But having said that, we still want to continue, the agency to continue to um, be able to respond to the needs of community gardeners. And the gardens um, that have been established all these many years, we do need infrastructure. Um, we have in infrastructure issues. We, we, we want to take it to the next level. Um, the last go around, uh, Park's budget was 40 million, 8 million was for community gardeners. We're asking that you consider it to even strengthen that number because um, Green Thumb actually is the only agency remaining that is able to respond to our needs for um, uh, materials that we use in the garden, infrastructure issues like fencing. We would hope that they would be able to take us to the next level to give us, actually give us water to address the issues of um, adding value to the work that we do in the community gardens and to address the issues of um, an aging infrastructure. And so I would like to go on the record in support of the agency to strengthen their budget. Our city council member, Robert Carnegie, is very active in uh, making sure that happens, and we hope that um, it can continue. I want to say hello to my ally over here, Community Garden, New York City Community Garden Coalition. We hope that there's a space for them too, because we do not consider um, uh, Green Thumb the Antichrist. We can all work together. And there is power in numbers. And therefore, thank you very thank much you. for thank you. the time. Next, please. Hi, uh, my name is Marilyn Kelly. Oh, sorry about that. My first time doing this. Um, I'm a naturopathic physician and also a local community gardener at uh, La Plaza. And um, not to belabor the point of the licensure agreement, but um, we've been communicating with Green Thumb, or trying to, on several occasions, and sending them many, many documents, meeting with them in person. So Bill Asasso's colleague, who was speaking before about how he doesn't know where the documents are, he gets too many documents, that's a complete fallacy, because we've met with them in person many, many times, asking them to change the document, or at least to negotiate with us, which they refused to do. They changed one part of the document, which involved dogs. <laughs> so that's something. But gardens, NYCCGC, and lungs have tried to communicate on multiple occasions to no avail. <clears throat> um, I would hope that they would redact the signed licenses until they can further communicate effectively with us on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Any yeah. questions? Um, shout out to for Junior Tennis, Scott Daly. It's an amazing program, well spent. Kids have fun. I'd like to expand it, definitely. Uh, uh, and, I, and I appreciate all your advocacy, by the way. Um, and, and the community gardens are a valuable, valuable um, program in, inside our communities. And, um, but, uh, but thank you all for your advocacy for parks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you all. The next group will be Ozzy 
Degan from New York Community Garden, Charles Quizzo for Lunds, Louisiana, Luzada United Neighborhood Gardens, and Jose Molina, NYC Parks and, and Recreation. Please identify yourself and, and begin. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aziz Day Khan. I'm the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I have in front of me the 17-page uh, license that was issued. Um, it's 10 pages longer than the previous license, and this is what most of the gardeners think of it. If the number is 87% of the people who've signed this license, I would suggest to you that 40% of that, them have signed under coercion. And the coercion is, is specifically being denied resources, projects, and told that if they don't sign, they will be locked out. So, you know, discussions are fine, but they haven't discussed with us. Your office, uh, uh, Councilman Ku, has been delayed a month in meeting with them. They've, they've tried to set, we've tried to set up meetings with you folks, and each time they've backed off meetings. Um, I'm gonna be kind to uh, um, <laughs> Sam uh, Biederman. Um, he obfuscates what he was saying about his testimony, and specifically, I'll tell you, um, the event permit is 17 pages. It's 17 pages. He says it's one page. Yeah, it's one page to start, and then there's 16 pages behind it. 17 seems to be a magical number here, right? So there's this discrepancy that he describes about between the license and the handbook. The license refers to the handbook, and then there are rules and regulations within the handbook. And then the handbook refers back to the rules and regulations of the Parks Department. And those three uh, components do not jive with each other. And they do not jive with each other, and then we have a potential of being um, uh, put under termination because we're not following rules. Which rules do we follow? And they don't make that clear. Oh yeah, they'll mail you uh, changes, but although those changes may be too late to be sent. Another point, they talked about uh, the reason why they do this event thing is because there was a, a, a trouble at one event. Yeah, that event was sanctioned by Green Thumb, so they knew exactly what was gonna go on at that event. And finally, the liability issue. Look, this is New York City. I grew up in New York City. This is the greatest city in the world. Are you telling me you can't find a way to get a $300,000 liability policy to cover community gardens? It's a rounding error of a rounding error of a rounding error of this budget. It's insane to say this. And they don't even want to come to the table and talk to us. They hide behind legal counsel. We demand, and Silver, Commissioner Silver said it today, you should hold him to this. He, well, he says he will meet with us, but don't meet with individual gardeners. Meet with the group, because when you talk to individual gardeners, you're coercing them to sign. You're telling them they're gonna be locked out, that they can't get projects. I know I'm over time, I have to say this. It's not fair. It's not fair to community gardeners who provide $14 million in free labor to this city, to steward uh, city property. It's not fair that we have to go out in the middle of the winter and shovel city sidewalks. We've just heard about all these people who, have, who, who are in, in the, in the uh, Parks Department who are working. We work for free. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Charles Grizzell. I'm the president of Lungs, which is Lower East Side of United Neighborhood Gardens. Um, I've been a gardener since 1996 in the Lower East Side. I started Lungs in 2011. It's a network of the 50 community gardens on the Lower East Side. Of those gardens, 38 are on Parks property. Of those 38, 19 have signed this license agreement. The other 19 are still opposed to it, and we're very much opposed to it. We've been trying to meet with Green Thumbs since September, and they've refused to meet with Lungs and the Garden Coalition because we represent uh, umbrella groups for the entire gardens. They will now meet with individual gardens, and they're trying to separate us. 
Lungs is, last year had uh, $25,000 in Parks Initiative money. We, we had six programs that we provided free in the community gardens in my neighborhood. So we, uh, we are a network of, a true network of the gardens in the neighborhood. We've been, we've won awards from Green Thumb for being an organizing group, but they will not meet with us now. Now Green Thumb and the Parks Department are using uh, threats and coercion to get other people to sign. For our purposes right now, Green Thumb and Parks are refusing to go along with a HUD-funded HUD um, capital improvements project for the community gardens in our neighborhood because license agreement has not been signed. So they're trying to kill a project that would improve city property, capital improvements, green infrastructure, and they will, not, uh, they will not even meet with us. They will not even respond to us with a phone call or an email. This has been going on since September. And we're at the end of our ropes, really. We're really, really tired of this. We feel like we've gone as far as we can in, with goodwill. Well, now we have to go public and make us stink about it. And it's not what we want to do. We want to be gardening. We want to work with the Green Thumb. We want to map something that we can build upon not something that's being destroyed. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jose Molina, and I'm a proud employee of this great agency. I am an associate park service worker in the Bronx for Borough Cruise. I'm here this morning to express the need for a larger budget for the Parks Department in general, but especially for the Associate Park Service Worker. I don't understand how we are one of the least budgeted titles in the city with having the, enti the same entities of other agencies. Let me break it down a little bit, um, what we do in the Parks Department. We lay down asphalt, concrete, install chain link fencing, and repair guardrails at the same level as the New York City Department of Transportation. We drive 16 yard, cubic yard tr garbage trucks, picking up tons of garbage daily without limitations, unlike sanitation, who limits their weight lifting to 50 pounds. We also operate plow trucks for snow removal in and around our parks and help the Department of Sanitation with plowing our streets, but at half their pay rate. With all of this, we still, with all of this, we still have to restore and maintain sports fields, baseball fields, cricket fields, soccer fields, playgrounds, lawns, pools, beaches, special events, and so many other things with our heavy equipment. We are also the top agency when it comes to storm removal for down trees all over the city with our chainsaws, chippers, and loaders. We are the only, we are the only title to operate heavy equipment such as the back holes, the front end loaders, container trucks, skid steers, six yard, cubic yard dump trucks, rack trucks, bulldozer, flatbeds, bucket tractors, with all the different, with all the different um, changeable units, surf rakes, and garbage trucks. We are, we are very limited to these equipment and are in need for a larger fleet in order to continue in maintaining our agency's properties. I believe more monies can be utilized by insourcing and hiring more associate park service workers who can do the same and are doing some of the same work as private contractors, but at a fraction of the cost repairing Prox properties. I pray and hope, um, I pray and hope today to please consider a major change in budget for the unsung heroes in the Parks Department. Thank you very much. Next, please. Um, when it comes to APSWs, like Jose Molina, they do a lot of the work in the parks like paving, they, um, they do guardrail. They can do 
things like build park houses. I think it costs an average, I believe, of $3.6 million for a little park house bathroom. They can do the job. They can pay, they can do the pavers that you see in all these parks. They can lay that down, again, at a fraction of the cost. Why doesn't the Parks Department consider insourcing? I know they tried to do it, or so they say, but they never really implemented a viable program that would save the city millions of dollars. Thank you. So I do have a question for Mr. Aziz. So how much produce you uh, produce, <laughs> you, you grow every year, I mean every season? Uh, uh, it, it really depends on the gardens themselves. It depends on the weather. I mean, we're, we're, we have an early spring. Uh, trees are blooming earlier than I've ever seen them bloom in New York City. Um, there's numbers that I don't have at hand right now, but we produce an awful lot of food. I, along those lines, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, community gardens are in neighborhoods that are underserved and they're underserved by f with fresh produce in particular. Mm -hmm. And so often we call these neighborhoods uh, food deserts. Let's be clear about this. These are not food deserts. These, this is food apartheid. This is, this is pretty much, the system is against people getting produce. And so community gardens are a major source of produce and giving fresh produce where there is none in these neighborhoods. And I can get you those numbers. So what do you do with the fruits and all this? You gave it away or you sell it on market? Uh, most of them give them away. Um, there's uh, people, you know, they grow for their own growing, actually. They, they grow for their own use, mostly. Charles, you can answer to that, too. Yeah, the, the gardens in my neighborhood that grow uh, food, they basically eat it themselves. They share it with the neighbors and everything, but they don't sell it. They, it's, yeah. it's for the neighborhood. So there's no like, farmer's market for you guys? We, have, we run a CSA every week in, in, out of the gardens. So people can come in for $10 a, a, a week. They can get a bag of, f of fresh produce. But we get it from a farmer upstate in Orange County. We've been doing this for six years now. So you only do this as a hobby, right? I'm no. sorry? I don't know so much as a hobby. I think it's a passion, frankly. Passion, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we steward land in the city. And... Uh, you know, we, we try to keep these, these spaces open and, and open to people and produce as much food as we possibly can. Not every community garden produces food, but they're, you know, they're called community gardens because they're for communities. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Finally, we have the last panel for Yolanda. Belcher, uh, East 43rd Street Community Garden, and Elizabeth Madonna, Mad Madalando Community Gardens. Last two. Yeah. So please identify yourself and you may begin. Okay, good afternoon and thank you, Ms. Co, for inviting us today. My name is Yolanda Belcher and I'm the president of East 43rd Street Community Garden, one of the gardens that was created as a result of a grant from Councilman Jumani's office. So I was there from the beginning when uh, it was an abandoned city lot and it took major construction for us to bring it up to a working condition, but since then, uh, the land was transferred to the Parks Department because it was leased land at that point. So I'm here to talk about what we did at the community garden. We grow f vegetables. My particular box, I grow um, eggplant and cucumbers and flowers and things like that. And I basically donate it to the neighbors. I donate it to the grocery man around the corner who allows us to use his bathroom for our kids. Um, what I do is I also volunteer my time to have um, the kids come into the park and we teach them about Mother Nature. 
Uh, we also have third graders that come into the park and an after school program that we also teach them about no, Mother Nature. We have a reading program that we partner with our local Clarendon Public Library that come in and bring in books and, and read to the kids and they love reading and after they finish reading they go to our uh, community beds and they look at the things that they grow. They don't even know where the food comes from, but when they see it in the garden, they can actually relate to where the, 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 uh, their produce is grown. Now I'm here to also talk about um, Green Thumb and the relicensing issue that I think is appalling in that they ask us to assume the liability of the premises owner. Now I'm just a personal person and I can't understand why an owner of a premises would want me responsible for his responsibility to the state. If somebody falls on the sidewalk outside, I have to be responsible for that. I think it's a little bit onerous that we have to be responsible for any, any and everything. Soil uh, containment, I work in raised beds. The soil was already not good but I have to be responsible if I sign this relicensing. And, and let's talk about indemnification. I think it should be an apportionment of value. You're a premises owner, I'm a volunteer. The volunteer work that is not contained in the relicensing is what it takes to do to event planning. I have to create a flyer, I have to reach out to people in itself to make an event worthy. I take 15 hours to create the event and that's not actually running the event. And that's not including growing food. You know, there's a lot of labor involved that this relicensing does not include. But it, it makes it seem that we're not people. They don't treat us like we're people. I've been, I've been uh, a person where Green Thumb, they come in and they're going to uh, build um, raised beds because mine has been canceled. And they say to me, a month after it happened, Okay, uh, well, I, I just wanted to say that Green Thumb doesn't necessarily treat us fairly, and I want to express that. Okay, next, please. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Ruth Maldonado. I want to thank the City Council for um, everything they do for us, and also the Parks Department. I appreciate a lot, and I use the parks every day. Um, I am a uh, I'm an associate professor of humanities at Boricua College, and I've lived in the Lower East Side for 40 years. I've been a community gardener since the 1980s, and uh, I can attest to uh, a lot of the uh, things that are saying. I want to bring our, our recommendations and demands right up front, which are that the, garden, the gardens should not depend on funding or even on their very existence on whether or not they sign this license until it has been hammered out to the agreement of all. So that's my recommendation that you meet with us and that we get that squared away. Um, I want to make an appeal for the culture of New York City and relate that to the gardens because, you know, as New York City, as we look around, um, it's getting less and less of the people by the people and for the people, which is what this room is supposed to be about. So I do get emotional about that because I hear a lot, well, what do you do for us? Well, we are our community. You know, these gardens were started by people and there being um, a, a lot of the people who started the gardens are uh, contributing culturally to the community and um, these license agreements that are trying to get us to apply to be able to gather. I mean, this is a really scary thing if you think about it. So I want everybody to ask themselves, do you want our city to be unique and to have the qualities that the community gardens have given it, or do you want it to go with a way of looking like every other city in the, in the country? If your answer is that yes, you do want that, then please consider your constituents who will be disenfranchised and disempowered, including um, by one of the parks that's being attacked right now, which is the East River Park. I have to bring that in, in the time that I have. I'm almost out of time, but it does tie together because we have had a delay in the destruction of the East River Park. Um, the original agreement that was uh, worked out with the community has not been honored. And now that where's, where there's life, there's hope. So please do consider, as we still have our trees, our thousand old trees in the East River Park and the, the habitats and also our own habitat because we live outside of our homes in this park every day. 
So please consider coming to a plan when the park is going to be modified for flood abatement that it will consider keeping these things alive and not destroying them as, been, as has been planned. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any questions? Any more public participations? Seeing none, this meeting will be adjourned. Okay.